You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Billy Jensen. How are you, Bill? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Really good, thanks. Come away all over from America. Yeah. Good to see you. Very fascinating story from journalists to then catching killers, serial killers, the worst of the worst. And when you kind of go down that route, America does seem to have the biggest sort of killers. Here it's more gangland, maybe one person dead too. We've had a few serial killers. America just seems to have proper madmen. We've got... You've had you have Mad Men too. Let's yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. Mean, obviously, you know the Moore's murders is a perfect example mm-hmm. of that. But then you've got in America, you know we've got something like eighteen thousand murders every year. And yeah, we're a bigger country, but you know I'm not going to lie. It's the guns, uh, you know, and the the it's guns, it's drugs, it's gangs, it's a transient sort of population that moves around a lot. So you've got you've got this population. That, um, you know, we used to solve in 1960, it was a 90% solve rate, what we call a clearance rate. So if you were murdered, 90% chance it was going to be solved. Right now, it's hovering around 53%. So 53, you know, 47% of murders in America are not solved. And though that, that grows every year. So that number grows every year. So this 250, you know, when I first started this, you know, like solving the murders, it was 200,000 murders in America that are unsolved since 1980. You know, now that that's up to 250,000 murders unsolved since 1980. And, you know, in England, you, and in Scotland and in Ireland, and even in Germany and, and, and the rest of Europe, you have one murder, you're able to, you know, they can put a lot of cops on it. But in America, if they don't solve it within a week, there's going to be another murder and then they got to go do that. Why is the number rate rising with unsolved murders? Is that lack of policing? What is that? That's, you know what, it's obviously, you know, guns, drugs, lack of uh, trust in the police. Uh, nobody wants to talk to the police. And then there's a, um, uh, you know, sort of a, you know, the legal verification. Listen, listen, in 90% in 1960, they were probably beating a lot of, a lot of confessions out of people too. So let's, let's try to be honest with that. But there's just also a lot more murders too. And then the less murders that you solve, the more murders there are going to be. There's a direct correlation because obviously a lot of these people are going to kill again and again, you know, even if they're not necessarily the serial killers that they make movies out of, but they're just the regular, you know, serial killers. And let's be honest. Remember the whole genre of true crime started here, you know, started in London with Jack the Ripper. I mean, that was really where this whole thing started yeah you had true crime stories as early as the bible but you know the second story in the bible is 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 a crime but you've got uh you've got you know jack the ripper which is still unsolved and still probably one of the most you know alluring true crime cases in history why do you think it's a turn on for people even true crime gangsters murders people gravitate towards it it's the biggest sellers on netflix my podcasts why do people? Why is that such an attraction for people? To, I, I love the dark movies sometimes. Horrors maybe not so much, but you love the crime kind of aspect of it. For the gangster side, it was me, the shootings, the killings. But you don't even think twice of it. Yeah. Um, and obviously you've got your serial killers, but there's no difference for any killings, killing. But why do you think it's a turn on for people? Yeah, you know the. It's different too. It's just, and it very like for the gangster stuff. That's way more men. Men like that. So that's that's geared towards men. So gangsters, heists. That's more men. For females, it's more scams and murders. That's the way it breaks down. And true crime in America is like eighty percent female who watch it. And uh, you know, it's a it's a matter of you know turning order, turning chaos back into order. Mm-hmm is something that is very much a a human need for to, to be done you want that order back and uh you know every true crime story sort of set, starts the same in that oh it was a peaceful community she was she had a smile that lit up a room 
And those are the story. And then she is murdered. Now, those are the stories that make it onto television. The stories that I always gravitated towards were the imperfect victims, the victims that might have been um, sex workers or might have been some, you know, uh, addicted or something. And then uh, obviously um, nobody, you know, when they get murdered, nobody's looking for their killers. Did you ever watch Monster? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. That was a great movie. Uh-huh. Yeah. Charlene Theron. Mm-hmm. Theron. Um, with her and she was in prison and she was killing all the men who were paying off for sex work. Yeah. And very rare, too, to have a female serial killer. You you actually had a lot of females, not a lot, but you had female serial killers back in the 30s and 40s that were uh, killing for insurance and that kind of thing. Um, or Lonely Hearts killers. They would get a man, they would kill him, they would get the insurance or their pension or something. Yeah. But um, Eileen Wernos, obviously, she was doing it for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before we get into the nitty gritty robo, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get more of a, an understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay. Yeah, I grew up in um, uh, on Long Island, which is right outside of New York City. And uh, when I was five years old, we had Son of Sam. We had the we had the serial killer that was that we called him the forty four caliber killer who was killing brunettes in cars on lovers' lanes. And that was my first sort of introduction to crime. I was five years old. It was 1977. And I just remembered the fear around it. it. He was killing a lot of people in Queens, which is just, you know, about five, six miles away from me. And um, when they caught him, it's my earliest memory of ever saying anything. My dad showed me his picture on the cover. And I said, he looks like a turkey. I remember. And he does. You know, when you look at David Berkowitz, he does not look like, you know, you want these you want these serial killers to look like snarling monsters. And if you ever see the depictions of Jack the Ripper, you know, they they make him look so evil. He probably was some schmuck. You know, he probably was some guy that, you know, wasn't very threatening potentially at all. And, um, you know, from there, I was, a, you know, typical generation x american kid you know i liked uh you know, sports and liked you know goth music and was big into uh the cure and the smiths and that kind of thing and really found you know a home within those bands and that was sort of like you know my identity but also i played hockey and things and yeah i went to you know i went to a school to study uh, i studied religious studies i studied cults uh, new religious movements uh, as they call them and um, from there, you know, my dad got sick. So I was going to be a professor and I had gotten a master's degree. I was going to get a master, I get, get a PhD. My dad's a house painter. My dad got sick. So I went home to sort of save the family business and um, I needed a creative outlet. So I started writing about, and I started a zine about hockey fights, you know, for, um, you know, ice hockey, which is not as big over here, but over there, uh, you know, and I would write, I would really write about the fights in the same way that people would write about MMA, you know, and um, I, I, a newspaper saw it and offered me one, one article to write. And then I just wrote that and just started pitching and pitching more articles and more articles. And then eventually I got a gig with the New York Times and uh, was sent out on my first murder case. And that was a case of a man had just moved in with his family into a house underneath the house he's cleaning out you know there's always junk in the house he's cleaning out the crawl space in the house and this is suburban long island and he finds a barrel and it's really heavy like a 55 gallon drum and he opens up the barrel and there's a, a skeletal remains in there of a woman actually mummified remains and um you know i was work they sent me out there started interviewing people nobody would talk to me i i get on the phone the uh the guy who had owned the house previously and I said, you know, your house, Mr. Elkins, hi, your house was just sold. Oh, yeah, it was like, a, you know, they found a, a barrel with a body in it. You have any idea how that got there? He went, really? I said, yeah. I said, do you ever go down there? He said, well, why would I, you know? And uh, a week later, that guy shot himself in the head because he had been sleeping with his secretary. He got her pregnant. He killed her, put her in a barrel, lived up above her with his family um, for five years, and then they moved. So that was my first... You know, my first case that I ever covered in true crime or in crime, I hate to use true crime, but it was solved with, you know, I, I talked to the killer that night and really his secret, his 30 year secret was up from my phone call and everything else has been harder than that. Cause that was the, you know, it's like, that was beginner's luck. That was, 
that was easy. Why do a lot of killers keep the bodies under their floorboards or in their gardens? I think that was just about convenience with this guy. And I think he just, maybe he thought he would move her at some point, but he never did. He was lazy or something, but you know, the, the whole floorboards thing and Edgar Allan Poe, you know, it's like mm -hmm. that kind of deal. And, but, uh, you know, typically you don't see it that much. You see, you do see serial killers keeping uh, mementos, keeping trophies. And that's one of the things like when they caught the Golden State Killer or, or when they caught Long Island serial killer, you're wondering like, are there any trophies? You know, usually it's, you know, clothing or driver's licenses or jewelry. Usually it's jewelry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about the religious uh, cults? Mm -hmm. What was that? Uh, you know, I was studying a lot of these apocalyptic Christian movements that were out in America and, uh, they were kind of rising up and, and, um, you know, you see, obviously you had Jonestown, you have that, that sort of thing where there's crime involved, but there was a lot of white supremacist, uh, Christian cults that I was studying. And those kind of went away, actually, they were kind of tied in tangentially to the Oklahoma city bombing. And then when that happened, there was a big clamp down. A lot of people actually went away with it just because so many kids were killed. They didn't want anything to do with it. So that kind of went away. And I think it's kind of morphed a little bit into, into other uh, areas, you know, white, white uh, or uh, right wing, you know, sort of uh, ideology when it gets violent is obviously still big in America. It's just different. It turns into, you know, lone gunmen, that kind of thing. You know? Some mad stuff. Is it the Mon Monmans? Um, I watched a documentary on Netflix last year. Some crazy shit happens on in some of these places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Killings, grooming. Yeah, well, I mean, most Mormons are great. I mean, I mean honestly, they're, that, that's a, it's a, it's a, uh, the, uh, I interviewed these two kids who once went and found, who are Mormon kids, who found a, uh, a dead body, uh, which had a, a reward for it in, in Utah. And they were great kids, great interviews. You know, they have to go do their, uh, um, their missionary work. So they're really good talkers, great interviews for kids wise. Uh, but you know, you do have offshoots like you have in any religion. That's going to be a little, yeah. a little wild. Yeah. I think as human beings are just wild in a whole. I just think religions, people can then use that as a pass or, mm -hmm. or kind of blame a religion. It's the mindset. Um, I think people can gravitate towards something to make it out as if it's a religion or this or that. But I think their minds are some of them are already gone. Yeah, and I think they can play on the religion card. Oh yeah, yeah. you can. You can. It, I learned very early on, and one of my professors said, "The Bible can say whatever you want it to say." You know, if you want to try and rule the world, the Bible is for you. If you want to be a monk, the Bible is for you. If you want to kill a bunch of people, the Bible. You know, you can always get it to say whatever you want it mm -hmm. to say. What do you think of religion now? What do I think of it now? I mean, I think that. Uh, you know, for people that, that, you know, I admire people that, that have faith in, 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 in a God. It's something that I never really had, you know, and being in the, in the program, I've been sober for two years and, you know, they, they talk about a higher power and everything. And I have to morph that into something different just because I'm not necessarily into the, the, the whole Christian God of it. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we need it. Obviously human, hum, human beings need it always because it's been there for a while yeah. you know it's the guidance i think humans need that's i think some people need to be led i don't think everybody are leaders mm -hmm. um with religion it can be a big divide in the world because with so many religions so many gods yeah who's right so um i've got many we've done a homeless documentary and um a lot of people turn to christ to her on the streets and do amazing things mm -hmm. i know many muslim brothers and sisters who follow a good religion but again, there's darkness in all religions. There's darkness, kind of, um, kind of weird, satanic, kind of eating blood and flesh and yeah. drinking blood, and uh, you just think, does it need to be there? But again, it's the way you look at it. Like you say, you can take anything you want out of what you read, but uh, and people can be brainwashed as well. And for me, I don't know what religion's real. I just, is there a higher power? I genuinely believe so. What it is, I don't know. Um, but the way humans are here and how we function, how we communicate, is, it's a miracle. But yeah. I don't have the answers for it, and I don't think textbooks can give us the answers because a lot has been changed, so I don't think we'll ever really know the truth. But again, I could be wrong, but that's just the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's... Uh, it's uh, And people also need to be around other people too. You know? yeah. I mean, that's where a lot of people met their 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 mates um, was, was at church or at religion, you know, whatever... 
And we also have what um, it was a sociologist named Emil Durkheim. He, he calls it the collective effervescence when you're around other people and you're experiencing something at the same time. And we've really lost a lot of that communal. Like we don't even go to the movies anymore. We're doing a lot of stuff at home in front yeah. of our computers and we're missing that that communal aspect of it, which is so important. You know, probably like the biggest place you get it now is, is sports. You know, you mm -hmm. go to a, a soccer match and everybody is, you know. Tribalism. Into, yeah. 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 Tribalism is massive. Like you say, it's back then everybody had their own little tribes, family, mm -hmm. friends, everything was in-house. Now everything's just scattered. Yeah. And human connection is important for anybody, even if you're feeling down, especially yourself who's battled addiction like myself. But we always hide it well. But when you actually open up to people who are around you on the same path, it makes it easier. Yeah. And I think as I had a man on just before you. He was SES, uh, train yeah. killer, but 47 years it took him to open up and tell his story, bottled it all up. Yeah. Full of hate, full of rage, alcohol. And uh, as soon as you talk, it heals. Mm hmm. But yeah, we don't gotta, because we've got too much pride. You got to talk, yeah, yeah, especially for the men. You know, that's one of the things that like a podcast like yours, and and you're seeing a lot of it over in uh, over here, the the uh, trying to save men. You know, obviously men, 80% of suicides are men. Um, uh, what they call deaths of, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, overdoses obviously are huge now, uh, especially with fentanyl and suicides, deaths of despair, they call them. And, uh, you know, there's that, there's that group, um, how are you out of 10? I don't know if you've seen that, those guys. Yeah. yeah. So it's like that sort of stuff is, is needed, you know, because yeah, a lot of men are, you know, it's, it's usually, it's like middle-aged men that are, that are killing themselves mm -hmm. more than anybody else. Yeah. So how do you go from writing stories about ice hockey fights to then uh, writing about the murders to then actually solving murders? Yeah. Like it's big, it's big transitions from being a journalist writing about ice hockey to then like writing about the murders is a powerful thing anyway yeah. but so you started with that how when did you how does that take effect on your mind because you're concentrating on a lot of negatives of murder and it's quite dark but does it affect you or is it just you know a job what? not not so much i mean people used it when i when when I finally, you know, realized I was an alcoholic, I realized I was an alcoholic a while ago. And then when I finally got help, when people knew about it, people were like, oh, no wonder you work on such dark things. And I was like, no, if this is about a human condition or genetics or whatever it is, or childhood. It's not about that. Um, so it didn't really affect me that much. But, um, you know, how I got to it was I would write these stories. Uh, usually, you know, I would always go to a story that nobody else was covering. You know, so I covered a story about the only murder on 9-11 in New York City, other than the murders at the towers. Uh, and that was um, a man who was murdered in bedford Stuy. So I, I just wanted to cover stories that had gotten completely overlooked. So I'd write these stories. What was that story? The murder at 9-11? So, yeah, so the um, he was a Polish immigrant and he had been in New York for a little bit. He was looking for a job. He was actually answering want ads at noon on that day. So imagine like the towers had just fallen and there's this guy that's like looking for work, but life's got to go on. He needs money for his family. He gets a job to clean a supermarket. His name is Henrik Shiwiak. And he gets off in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which back then was a rougher neighborhood. It's since been gentrified. And he gets off at the wrong stop and he doesn't really know where he is. He's knocking on doors and somebody shoots him in the back. So I went over there and I, uh, you know, started knocking on doors, just trying to figure out who shot this guy. Cause I talked to his family, his, his children didn't understand. His mother didn't understand. His mother thought he died in the towers and you know, she didn't get it. And, um, you know, uh, I remember talking to the police and they said, you shouldn't have done that. You probably talked to somebody who knew the killer and you're lucky you got out of there alive, but I just wanted those answers. So I would constantly, you know, I wrote up the story. It was a good story and I would write these stories, but they constantly had no endings. So when you're writing stories with no endings for 15, 16 years, it, it really taxes you. And, uh, you know, I had, I had, um, a friend of mine, um, was working on a book, uh, about the golden state killer who was this killer who had killed a bunch of people in, um, he would, he would break into people's houses. He would rape the women with the, with the men, um, next to them. Then he would bring the women sometimes in the other room and then tell the men, um, put a, a, a set of plates on top of the man's body and say, if I hear these plates move, I'm going to kill your wife. He eventually started killing both of them. 
and really sadistic guy. And she was working on this book about him. She passed away um, and uh, in her sleep. And uh, I was, um, you know, just so bummed in the sense where I was devastated, but also bummed that like, she was dedicating her life for five years about this case and she's never gonna get the answer, even though she worked on so much. So I helped finish her book. And then, you know, I was just, thinking about all these cases that we work on that never get solved. And then I, the one night I saw this video of this guy getting attacked in the street in Chicago. And he, um, this guy confronts him. He's a bigger guy. This guy confronts him. He runs away as you're supposed to do. You're supposed to walk away. This guy comes back up to him, punches him in the face. He lands in the crosswalk, the victim. And this is about four o'clock in Chicago in a, in a very populated part of Chicago, but it's 4 a.m. The guy then yells at every, you know, people come to assist him. Well, first he, he punches him, knocks him out cold. Two guys from across the street run and empty his pockets. And then, which is just sickening to see. And then you see him, um, uh, laying there, the guy who had hit him yells at people. You can't hear it, but you hear, you could see he yells at people. They go away. So he's lying in a crosswalk and then a cab runs over him and kills him. And they had pretty good video of the guy and, but it had been like six months and, and they were, they were doing another press conference. I was like, why do they not know who this guy is? And then I thought, I know why, because nobody watches the news anymore, but I think I could maybe find him. So I did this social media campaign where I made up a Facebook page and a Twitter page called the river North puncher, which is the name, his name and posted the, the, the video of him and say, does anybody know who this guy is? And um, I started geo-targeting ads. So I would buy ads like in a, in a one mile radius of where the murder happened. And somebody wrote to me and, and said, um, I hope this, you know, I got retweets from a lot of people that were pretty successful, you know, just begging people to retweet it. And then somebody wrote to me and said, I hope this helps. And it was a front facing image of this guy's face. And so now I had it in color and everything. And I thought the guy had made it up like he did it with computers or something. And I asked him, I said, Can, were you there? Like, what, what is this from? Guy went right back, went right back. I hounded him, hounded him. And then he sends a video. So he had taken a video or he says his friend had taken a video. And the video is of our victim on the ground in the crosswalk, passed out. And then it's the last image of him alive. And then you, it swings up and then you see the killer walking straight towards the camera. So now I had a front face of the killer. So I took that video and then Cook County, which is where Chicago is, they put all of their mugshots up online. So I just went through every mugshot. And the guy had a very distinctive like widow's peak. So I went through every mugshot, looked for widow's peaks, and I found three guys. One guy, I didn't know how tall he was though or anything, and then I went to Chicago with his picture and the third into that neighborhood at night and uh the third person i walked up with with that photo they said oh yeah that's that's big we call him big dummy his real name is marcus and then i found him so then but then it was a matter of getting the police to act and that's a whole nother thing why well, if you've got evidence <laughs> you know sometimes police don't want to don't want to deal with it you know so i said this is the guy they said thank you that's all they did and then I was tracking him. I found his Facebook and he was saying he was living in Holbrook, New York, but really I knew he was actually in Minnesota because he had taken a picture of himself and behind him, there was a truck and a logo of it. And the logo was of a Minnesota, um, work truck. And also I know his brother lived in Minnesota. So I was like, he's at his brother's house. I'm so like constantly, and then calling the aldermen that are there, like, you know, the local politicians constantly calling everybody. Finally got a warrant, finally got him arrested. And then just, you know, getting the phone call from his uh, his niece, who really is like his sister, because he was raised by his aunt. You know, she calls me up and just says, we got him, you know? And then you get that, that rush. And then, um, you know, being able to identify him and then get him, and then using a system, using social media, it's just like, well, I can't just sit on my hands and not do this for other cases. And then I started doing tons of other cases, yeah. Did you have to go to court for that one? Mm-mm. 
So you don't get called as a witness? Didn't get called as a witness, no. What, and I don't ask for any of the rewards or anything. That's for the tipsters that come in. What you know? was it? What did he get, that guy? You know, unfortunately, he only got like three years. One, you know, I think he maybe served one and a half. It's not, it's a, not a cold-blooded murder, it's that. No, I mean, they're calling it. it it's still, it's maybe, that, it's kind of like what you, you know, you have less sentences over here, but, um, you know, there was other circumstances that he probably could have gotten more. Not self-defense, no. I mean, it was just they they tagged it as an assault, you yeah. know, but I think his menacing behavior to the people that were trying to help the person is the reason why he gets run over, mm -hmm. you know, so it should have been more than, than just the assault. Yeah. So is that what triggered then everything for you to then keep going? Yeah, so then it was is a matter... Is that a buzz as well, though? Like... Uh, that must be a buzzard, I imagine, adrenaline high to them. It was it going was, through detective mode. Yeah, it was for thirty seconds. I had the high, and then it we, then there's this come down where it's like, I I don't get to tell this guy how I did it, the the victim. You know, I wanted to share a, a beer when I was drinking back then with this guy, and, and this was like everybody loved this guy. He was an impeccable dresser. He was a great dancer. He was a you know, bartender at the Marriott um, in that same neighborhood. He just seemed like a great guy and he was gone. And it's just like, well, what, what are we doing here? You know? Yeah. So, but you got to keep going. So there was another case that I did about a, um, a man who gets killed in a, uh, in a Jack in the box, which is a, you guys have Jack in the box over here. It's like a, like a like a Wendy's or a or a Burger King, and uh, he wasn't even a great guy. He was actually you know he was a Mexican American. He was a big Morrissey fan because you know Morrissey's you know so uh, you know he's got the sideburns and everything and the pompadour. And guy jumps over guy. Uh, there's a video and I see the video. He jumps over the counter. You see him doing this, and then he jumps back over the counter again and leaves. And it turns out he had shot our victim, a guy named Juan Vidal, in the face excuse me in the chest and then um then he left same thing a couple months police had no you know and i said well listen you know i what i do is if i see a video normally i wait two weeks because a lot of times if it's a good video with a good uh, image they'll catch him and then i'll google it and then i'll say oh they got him this time the guy was wearing a halloween mask so i i, I contact la sheriffs i explain what i do you know, some cops get it, some cops don't. This cop got it. And he said, okay, yeah, let's let's do it. I said, I'm going to, you know, buy ads. I'm going to set up a, 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 you know, call it the Jack in the Box Killer, El Monte Jack in the Box Killer. And um, this was outside of LA. And, uh, you know, eventually we got a name for, you know, who the guy was. And that guy got life uh, for that case. Yeah. How was that feeling? I mean, that we actually, you know, to be honest with you, he was going up, he was up for the death penalty. And I, that was not a good feeling. I'm not a, I think there's always redemption in, in everybody. And I, the death penalty is something that is so final. I've never been a death penalty proponent. So, um, that was messing with my head when they said he was get, he was up for the death penalty, but then he pled and then just get life. What happened? Well, how would you feel if he did get a death penalty and died? Would you have blamed yourself? A little, yeah, a little bit. I mean, but then he could have killed somebody else, you know, so uh, there's a, it's not like he was going to be a, a saint after that, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, there was a little bit of, if I hadn't have done what I did, you know. So good result or bad result, you're still battling? Yeah. yeah. Have you always had that internal battle before you even started doing that work? <sighs> Never really felt about it until then, you know, mm -hmm. it was always just you're trying to break the world up in, into good and bad, into that mannequin split of of good and evil, of, of dark and light. And the world really isn't like that. You know, mm -hmm. we try to, we try to make it like that because it makes us feel better. You know, it's easy to be like, you know, root against the Nazis because the Nazis were so evil and, and then, you know, that kind of thing. So, but you, um, you've got, or like in Star Wars, you know, obviously the empire looked really evil and, blowing up planets but you know the world just isn't like that and there's shades of gray everywhere yeah everybody can see the world differently even if you get a bomb you can place a bomb and put a bomb on the internet and get every country to look at the bomb every country would see different what that bomb is used for mm -hmm. every man's killer can be another man's freedom fighter so it's yeah it's crazy how the media can manipulate it's okay to bomb one but not another oh yeah so support this but don't support that so Humans can be twisted um, and very easily manipulated. Humans, yeah, I'm surprised at how manipulated we can be. Yeah. Um, 
and how much we follow and believe everything that we see instead of questioning everything because whatever you're seeing in the media is there for you to then see the world for what it is but it's not really like that so yeah, yeah but I'm blessed enough to speak to enough people then to then understand it a little bit more so it's not that people are dumbed down it's just all they know mm -hmm. and when you, you show them facts and figures they still don't understand it and that's the frustrating thing yeah and the whole idea of needing these perfect heroes like you had you had roy Lauder on right mm -hmm. from uh the london bridge right and uh he you know he's the fact that he hasn't gotten the the george cross is is insane yeah. i mean this guy you know you know taking on three terrorists with suicide vests he didn't know they were they were real taking on three you know with machetes just with his hands and saying an epic line like fuck you i'm millwall you know this guy should be on posters in places you know i mean this guy should you know but you know he's had some troubles in the past but you know sometimes maybe you need a hard man like that yeah. in a in a situation like that mm -hmm. that isn't necessary you know the the other I, I don't think it was that one it might have been the other one there's been a lot of attacks over there the the spanish banker uh ignacio i think his name is who who um uh fought back the the terrorists with his skateboard like that guy might be a saint like they literally might make him turn into into, into a saint you know which is mm -hmm. great too you know mm -hmm. but it's you know it's the same situation this guy did not hesitate and i love roy larner's quote uh, of like, you know, I was with older people and it, and, and it seemed out of order, which is such like a great line right. of like, <laughs> it just seemed out of order for these guys to come in and yelling Allahu Akbar and, and then him just going up and saying, fuck you, I'm Millwall, you know? But every sinner, every saint was a sinner. Every saint oh, yeah. sinned before they became a saint. Yeah. It's life. Some people learn from it. Some people don't. Yeah. Everybody makes mistakes. And like you're saying, he has a hero. He lists risked his life to save others yeah not knowing the outcome and again he's just forgotten the poor yeah. bastard like this is a reality though the media picks who they want to be heroes oh, and yeah. who they don't we can put a guy on tv and make a couple of good lines with his name and they automatically think he's a hero but that's just the way they portray them yeah i think this i you know everyone's asking me what my next project is going to be and after covering killers for so long and everything the one the one problem with crime as a genre is that you have all of these it's like having a world with all supervillains and very few heroes um because you can't name who's the cop who caught ted bundy you know you can't name that person you know so you don't really have a ton of heroes but you know ask any crime you know reader they'll know bundy and gacy and, and, and sperkowitz and all of these names so but the you know what is the psychology behind the person that runs towards an ordinary citizen not a cop or, or even an emt who runs towards the danger uh that that's something that i'm very fascinated with and there's multi layers to it. and i kind of want to find out you know what's the what happened in those people's lives that make them yeah. do that you know so i started solving the you know and you know there's there's probably about five that that pr probably wouldn't have been solved without my me helping um there's other there's about you know a, a half dozen more that like i was able to get a piece that would that they were able to use you know mm -hmm. whether it was a, somebody else in the car or something along those lines but you know the i have i've worked probably 50 cases and only we've only seen you know results in 10 of them you know there's still a lot that are out there that i really want to solve and uh there's this one there's there um again really clear video and i saw this video and it was a uh, this woman had been found in owls head park brooklyn at a skate park murdered you know almost mutilated uh, really badly and they had a video of her walking with a man and i'm looking at the video and the video is so clear and i thought i'm gonna get this guy in a week granted it's new york there's a lot of people around in new york bless you thank you um Granted, it's New York. There's a lot of people around in New York, but you've got, um, I just thought that there's, this video is so clear. He's wearing a track suit. He, the way he was walking, his gait, you can always find people the way that they walk uh, as an identifier. You can always find, the way he ashes his cigarette was very kind of almost dainty feminine. I was like, someone has to know something about this. So 
started running these ads, which cost money, you know, and I'm doing this out of my pocket, you know, so I was like running these ads, uh, got like a, I think it might be him, might be him. I think he was at a Hallel stand. I think he was this, you know, I'm doing the ads then in Spanish, doing him in Egyptian, doing him in Farsi, doing him in all these different languages. Ended up spending, you know, so I, I hit so many people in New York, millions of people. I remember, um, you know, like on Twitter, I would do them on Twitter and Facebook. This is really before TikTok took over. And I remember somebody saying like, can somebody catch this fool already? Because they were seeing the ad so much. <laughs> but the, the uh, I got a message. Well, I saw one comment because I check every comment. And the comment said, that was my mom. And it was, it was his, it was her, her son. And I said, I'm going to be looking for this guy the rest of my life, mm -hmm. um, just to get something like that. And, um, you know, it's been still in touch with the family and, uh, you know, the thing when you're working on a case like that, I tell people, you know, cause my first book, I write to people on, if you want to do this, this is how to do it. But it's a, it's a lifelong commitment. You know, you're going to, if you involve yourself with the fam in the family, they're going to talk to you forever and ask you things. And um, you never say you're too busy, never say you don't do it anymore. It's like, this is it. You're in it forever. And I still talk to, you know, that was six years ago, seven years ago. I still talk to them, still talk to a lot of different families on, um, you know, over Facebook and everything. It's yeah. mind boggling though how with all the CCTV, with all the, the dash cams on cars and taxis, that the unsolved murder rate is going higher. Yeah. Doesn't make sense With, to me. Isn't that crazy? With the, all the CCTV and the ring cameras uh, and all of the um, DNA. Yeah. You know, with all of that stuff, you would think that the murder rate, yeah, but it's just... Is that people yeah. getting smarter with it instead of kamikaze oh. or more planned, even though some people are killed on the street, it doesn't look planned, but... A little, a little bit, but it's, it's more, you know, it's a lot of just street crime. So it's a lot of somebody getting shot in an alleyway you know i was working this this uh, one case i think i send you it this case in in philadelphia uh recent um uh, this kid w had gone to a bar you know white kid uh had gone to a bar was walking back in a drexel uh university neighborhood fairly okay neighborhood and this he he's walking and he passes a guy and the guy just right right when he walks in the guy turns around pulls out a gun shoots him in the back of the head he falls down. You don't see him fall down. They cut that part of the video out. But then the guy, the guy's running away. He shoots behind him twice, like to get him twice. And, you know, we've got, he's wearing a mask. Um, the pandemic really screwed up a lot of stuff because like people can wear masks now and it doesn't look that weird, but he was wearing a mask. And, you know, I can see the way he walks. I can see kind of like what, you know, he looks like a younger black male, um, skinny, and um, got some tips with it. Got one that I thought was really good and they couldn't really do anything with it and still looking for him. And I still talked to his dad and his name was Everett Beauregard. But yeah, you you know, I try to get that that image in front of in front of everyone uh, to get that tip. But um, it's ha it's harder and harder just because nobody is really, you know, it used to be that there were three stations or over here, you know, they would be, it would, if they put something on BBC, you know, a lot, everybody would see it, you know, mm -hmm. you'd have market penetration of everybody seeing it. Um, you know, you, it, it, particularly in London, London has so much CCTV that it's hard to get away with anything in London, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cause London, because I think during the troubles, a lot of cameras were put up here. So, and they're all connected. So you've got a lot of CCTV uh, cameras here, but you also don't have any guns. Like last time I was in London five years ago, the big thing was these, those uh, acid attacks or five or six years ago where people were putting, you know, gang members had the acid in the Gatorade bottles and were throwing them on people. And obviously you have the knife stuff as well, but you don't have guns. I feel safer in New York than I do London. Yeah. Yeah. I fucking love New York. Uh-huh. Love New York. Just love the vibe about it. Love the people, love the, the buzz. Yeah. There's just something special about New York. Yeah. Something very special. Things happen there. Mm -hmm. And the Americans who are so helpful. Yeah. don't want to see you fail. People in the UK want to see you, maybe not fail, but they just don't want you doing better than them. Mm -hmm. And um, I wouldn't say it's on its ass. I have been saying that lately, but things need to change. It's becoming weaker, I believe, mm -hmm. the UK. I'm Scottish, so pff, it's, I'm, it's, it's good up there, but it has its own fucking problems with the laws and certain things are letting away with. And I just think something needs to change, man. Somebody needs to come in and shake things up. But 
London is becoming more dangerous. New York, I feel safe. I don't see any issues there whatsoever. Really? Yeah. yeah. You know, New York, one thing, there's a lot, there's people around all the time, particularly Manhattan. So if you're out, you're never kind of alone, as opposed to if you're in LA or something, there's nobody on the street in LA, especially downtown LA. I think somebody said it best when they said the difference between, we're always comparing New York and LA. Uh, New Yorkers are um, kind, but not nice. Uh, LA is nice, but not kind in the sense where they'll be kind to you. You'll be nice to your face, but you know, they don't really care about you. In New York, yeah. it really feels like from the person on the street to the wall street banker, you're a New Yorker, you know, and everybody's kind of in it for, for being New York, you know, New Yorkers are more New Yorkers than they are Americans. But the know? crime rate came down massively with the mayor. He changed everything, did he not? Um, who Giuliani? Yeah. 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 Now, Giuliani, for as obviously he's become, you know, a big villain in America now because mm -hmm. of him with Trump and everything and, and some of the missteps that he's taken. But he really did turn that city around. And some people said, oh, he gentrified it. He, he took away the character of it. You know, all the peep shows that were on 42nd Street are gone. Um, but. It was a scary place to go to in the 80s. Yeah, the Bronx and stuff. Yeah, was, and, that's beautiful now. Well, the Bronx, they used to just light it, light it on fire for the insurance. <laughs> so there would be, seriously, there would be so many, um, you know, during 1977, there was even, you know, during the World Series, there was a very famous, you know, um, Howard Cosell, and there was a fire going on in the background of the World Series. And it goes, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. That's yeah. mad. Yeah, yeah, New York's got something. I don't know if it's because I watched all the movies, through the years and it was all New York and what movies um Scrooge no, that's but, where you pick I was but, thinking you were going to pick The Godfather nah, but, but Goodfellas uh, you picked Scrooge uh, um, <laughs> it was uh Scrooge Bill Murray and um is it a long good not a long good Friday once upon a time in America once upon a time in America all right absolute yeah. fucking classic mm -hmm. man um Scrooge because I think I think that was about the 80s um and I just the buildings the yellow cabs yeah. I'm saying cab, it's taxi here, fuck's sake. I've went all American there, but it was, uh, I just love it. I was in America, I've been in America twice the last few months. It's just something special about it. I love the people, every guest that I have on as well, they open other doors, they don't hold anything back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, good on you. Yeah, you know what? It's um, particularly in in New York. It's such a special place, and uh, you know, as far as like crime in New York goes, obviously you have all of that the mafia crime. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'll be by like if you go to Spark Steakhouse. By the by the way, I always look at your Instagram. And a lot of times you're showing steaks. Yeah, you like eating yeah, steaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some of your steaks are not proper steaks i was like i was like he's getting when he when you come to america yeah. i'm gonna take you to a proper steakhouse yeah. yeah because i'm just like oh man that thing looks way too thin yeah it's like uh, i guess like what did we get 28 ounce here yeah uh, what is it 28 grams our steaks uh -huh. are shit and yeah. we pay top dollar for uh -huh. it as well mm -hmm. um new york's obviously bigger but yeah, so what were you saying about the yeah, steaks? Yeah, we'll, 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 I'll take you to Spark Steakhouse, okay. and that was a very famous uh, murder was there from, from the mafia, you mm -hmm. know. Umberto's Clam House, that was another, that was a crazy Joe Gallo mm -hmm. was murdered. So you've got all of these, these uh, the, the mafia crime there. Obviously, you've got, um, you know, mo most of the, the ser serial killers, though, were mainly out in the suburbs, you know, on Long Island. And, mm -hmm. and you know, my, you know, I grew up in a town called East Meadow, Westbury area. And um, produced two serial killers, Joel Rifkin, who was killed uh, 17 women, and uh, a guy named Robert Shulman. And now we've got the Long Island serial killer who was just caught, which is a case that I, I worked on and, and told a story on and uh, a podcast called Unraveled. And uh, that was, I think today, he is getting uh, charged with a couple other uh, murders as well. You know, as soon that's one of the things. Like, as soon as a guy gets caught with a murder that I know he was doing a bigger thing, like, like Golden State Killer or Bear Brook, the the only thing I want to know is who else. What what's his timeline, and did he kill other people? You know, and that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. What I don't understand though with the American police, as I interviewed a man called Larry Mazza. Larry Mazza worked with the Grim Reaper, mm -hmm. and they're saying he killed over two hundred people. Okay, and he was cooperating with the police. All these men are mass murderers, serial mm -hmm. killers, but. The police will still do deals with them and they're out within 10 years. Mm -hmm. like, that's a serial killer. Yeah. Why are they doing deals with these sort of men? I mean, you know, the same thing with Whitey Bulger. Like Whitey Bulger was working with the feds. Uh, he was a, a big Irish gangster uh, up in Boston. 
the uh, the departed was based around that his like his, movie. yeah yeah another great movie yeah That's so awesome. so uh you know what some <laughs> Not everybody that works for law enforcement is has all their screws in, you know. So if they see a means to an end of like, I'll be able to hit my numbers, be able to get these arrests or whatever, this guy's gonna not gonna kill women and children. He's just gonna kill another bad guy, then then go for it. And that's what has that's where that that idea comes from. It doesn't happen everywhere, but it's happened. The unsolved murder rate in the eighties must have been bad with the mafia. Uh, that, that yeah. late 70s and 80s because they were just killing for fun yeah walking up bullet in the head dropping the gun walking away mm -hmm. well but, you saw that in the irishman which which i i'm not sure if that guy killed everybody that he says he killed in the irishman you know they all but, talk uh, a lot of shit as well though. oh yeah yeah but whitey bulger was proper i had a boston man on i read i got his book sent and uh, i thought it was a real deal and it's what a story but then it turns out he was full of shit <laughs> says he was working with whitey bulger i had a guy on uh, he's on Instagram, he keeps tagging me in. Um, I think he was a Boston guy back in the day. But kind of exposing this guy, like I say, I, I'm not from Boston, I don't know who the fuck's real or yeah. fake, but it turns out the guy was full of shit, man. Yeah. And, uh, what was his name? Troubleshooter or something? Um, yeah, you know what, you've got a lot of, especially with with the mafia, Yeah, you got a lot of people that are, that are you know, the, the Irishman is a perfect example. You had this guy um, who said he killed uh you know the you know one of the one of the biggest you know unsolved cases in history which mm -hmm. is jimmy hoffa and also he killed crazy joe gallo and everybody else that i know that is connected or within that will say no it's not that's not him he didn't do that but made a good story and a great movie you what'd know, you think so. happened to jimmy hoffa i mean he definitely got put away i mean he he's he's under somewhere or is burned up somewhere but uh it's not like he was you know bottom line is he took on he wasn't giving loans to the mafia he was he potentially was going to ask for that money back you know so mm -hmm. that was um that was something that uh you just didn't do you know the mafia are proper though they're gangsters in my eyes like i interview gangsters here they're just nowhere near the organization and how it's running how ruthless they were they mm -hmm. were hitmen they were nutcases not all i used to think watch the gangster films and i thought everyone was a hitman a trigger man mm -hmm. it's not the case there's mm -hmm. only a couple in each family but they're all capable in their own right you have someone who have the baseball bat or whatever but when you see these guys you can see they're crazy mm -hmm. but larry fuck me man well over here you had the cray brothers yeah and uh and obviously that well one of them just definitely seemed more unhinged than the other yeah. but uh you know you've got you know over here it's it's interesting over here because you've got the whole you know when what we looked at at the UK from where we were we would hear about um obviously punk was big you know like we we liked the whole punk scene especially as like a punk goth kid myself but then, you know, the football hooligans. And that was like considered, oh, wow. And then we would wa listen to those stories. And we were fascinated by those stories, you know. And like, you know, uh, hearing those stories of what it was like to be in a firm. And and not understanding the fact that, you know, we had we would have fights. They would always be like, my dad, he used to take me to a lot of like New York Mets games and New York Jets games. And he would bring binoculars. But he would do it to see the fights in the stands. He loved seeing the fights. Mm -hmm. My dad, he passed really before the internet took hold, but he would have loved just seeing all the street fights and everything. He loved that stuff. He was a guy that, uh, he had been to jail. He had been an addict. He'd gone through all of that. And, um, he just, he just liked seeing people fighting. So, um, but, uh, you know, the idea that like the, the, the guys over here in the firms, like they never wore they didn't wear the kits or the jerseys of their fans uh, of the team or whatever like that. Like we, like we do in America, you know, they wear like proper uh, polo shirts. Uh, and <laughs> the ones we wear Stone Island tear and Fila and, uh, but yeah. it is crazy how people go down certain paths. It does. It, it fascinates me, the human mind. It genuinely fascinates me how people choose what they choose, but the American side of things and the criminals and the gangsters, it is more glorified, but it's more appealing because when you watch like good fellas, true stories and Donnie Brasco mm -hmm. Casino Scarface like you're attracted towards it yeah because it it seems an amazing life but when you speak to these people who lived that life is nothing but torture and no, pain no it was I mean if you look at Henry Hill I mean they showed from Goodfellas right they showed a guy that um 
was the prince of the city, really. You know, he was he had the you know the that scene where he goes in the Copacabana from the the back, back door. a great scene. Um, you know, this is a guy that every door opened for him and had money for everybody, but then his downfall was so big and also his addictions were so big too. You know, by the end, he was just this guy that was really just a, a shriveled old man, um, who had, who had seen, you know, his best days were definitely behind him. And they show that, you know, they show the paranoia and everything of him and having done so much Coke, but they don't show him 20 years later when he really is, you know, a shell of a human being. I'm surprised he never got killed. Yeah, it was always weird with him. You always thought that maybe somebody might have done it just to just to make a it name for themselves. Oh, people, people knew where he was. Day, yeah. yeah, people knew where he was. He yeah. turned. He turned. Pro, he became a proper snitch. He was the first big one, I think. But then I've interviewed Sam and the Bull, and he turned against Gotti. Yeah, and that was one of the biggest ones. But again, when these men talk now, people are saying they're this and they're that. These men weren't psychopaths back mm-hmm. in the day. They didn't fuck around and. Yeah, but it is still so appealing. Like, I do love interviewing these people to understand. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of see that you wouldn't fuck around with these people. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they have lived that life. They've got blood in their hands. They're not just portraying an image that they see in movies. The movies are written about these men. Mm -hmm. What was the, what was your third case? The one you'd done the first two? What was your next case after that? Let's see. So, so you've solved uh, 10? You know what? It, yeah. So the, actually one of them was, it was a murder of this guy named Pac-Man, uh, Adam Krosky. And he, um, I had put the ad up. Uh, he had been murdered. All I had was a video of of him. Actually, I'll show it to you. Yeah. Show me everything that you were going yeah, to Yeah, I will. Me. Yeah. I had video of him and it was just, it was pretty simple video. It was just of him walking, you know? That's it. That's what I had. Can we show this on screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's him just walking? Yeah. And then running? Yeah. So you can tell he's got longer hair. You can tell, really, it's the walk of him, the, yeah. the, the gate. So I um, uh, I set it up. I bought the ads and everything. What should we be spending on ads? <sighs> That one wasn't that much. That one was like 500 bucks. Like the one we were talking about, um, which we'll show. Actually, we should show this one too. You could splice it in, right? Um, This one. um, This is the guy from the Owl's Head, the Owl's Head Park one. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that is a fucking fake. Right? Flick of the ash, man. That's a gay man, right? (laughs) I mean, there's... (laughs) There's, there's something there, you know, with that ash. And uh, um, I have to think that he probably wasn't from New York, but he seems very comfortable in the city, though, you know, um, when you watch him. So, um, but with this one, this is an interesting one. It's actually tied into here. So I was, it was 2017. I'd set it up, didn't really get many, many hits. I had come over to England to see if this could work over here. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a, a show called Crime Watch over here. And they started doing it when the BBC kind of broke up and, and started doing their production in other areas, they were shooting it in Wales. So I'd never been to Wales before, went to Wales and met with them. They liked the idea um, of, you know, doing this kind of thing over, over here. Uh, police didn't, you know, um, you guys got different privacy laws over here and, and everything. So, uh, so I had, a, I had the day in Wales after that, you know, so I was in the Castle Keep in, in Cardiff and I get an email while I'm in the keep, in the castle keep, and I'm like, and it says, I know who this is. So I was like, what? So I was like, wait a minute. And then I called the person, got the name, sent the name over to the police, and they got him in uh, two weeks later. And um, it was, uh, that was one of those where, you know, I could be 4,000 miles away, 5,000 miles away, and, uh, you know, in the middle of Cardiff, and it was sweltering hot, I remember. And uh, it was, you know, I remember I was staying, I couldn't find a, I was, I was staying in Wales. I couldn't find a hotel because it turns out I think Robbie Williams was playing that night. So I had to stay like in a monastery <laughs> with no air conditioning or whatever. And, and I was jet lagged. It was so hot. But then this thing happened. And uh, th- this woman called, you know, uh, I contacted the woman. I remember I was literally in the castle, you know, mm-hmm. up high at, talking to this woman. It was a very, sur- about a murder that happened in you know the carolinas while i was you know over here so 
I mean, that's the thing. And the other thing is with these kind of things is that I always have my alerts on. It'll wake me up at three o'clock in the morning because if somebody says they know the person, you want to talk to them right away because they might not want to talk the next day. They might be a little drunk. They might be a little more forthcoming now than they would have been then so or or, or the next day. So um, I constantly have the alerts on. So if somebody says, hey, I know this, I I reach out to them right away. And, and they say, you know, because I'm not a cop, it seems like they, they'll more, a little bit more willing to talk. Um, a lot of times they said, no, I don't care about a reward, but sometimes they do want the reward and I'll send them over to them. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever get people telling lies saying they know the killer? Um, not so much lies. See, because you're not a cop, they would think it done for wasting police time yeah. or anything with them. Yeah, not so much lie. Just, just you know, I think it's this Massive guy, but it turns out to me not that guy. You know, mm -hmm. so that's it'll ha that'll happen. What sort of rewards are there for these people? Murders, unsolved murders, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand um, dollars. It depends. You know, there's this. Um, um, it can go anywhere from like three thousand to fifty thousand. You Who know. judges that? Is that worth the... It just depends on locally or if anybody has given money or something like that. So locally, you usually see with Crime Starvers, it's like $5,000. Mm -hmm. And that's for typically a conviction a lot or at least an arrest, you know? So, um, uh, you know, there was this one case that I had. I saw a, a, a murder that had happened in San Jose. This guy stabbed this other guy. And I called up the police. I say, hey, listen, I tell them my deal. I, I'm a... You know, I'm a journalist, but I do this. You don't have to, I'm not going to take any money. Um, and he said, he's like, wow, that's, that's really interesting that you do that. And he said, well, I've got this case. Can you help me with it? And I said, um, yeah, sure. And I never want to turn anything down. And he says, well, it's a fugitive case. I said, oh, I don't really do fugitive cases. You know, fugitive cases are different because you, you know who the person is, you know what they look like, you know what their, um, um, uh, what their hobbies are, what their line of work is, you know, you know, John who killed somebody, he's, he makes his living as an electrician and he likes to bowl. So then everybody that's watching say America's most wanted, they'll remember, wait a minute, that's Phil, you know, he, he's in our bowling league. It's, it's a, a little bit easier and it's just something that I never did. But he said, um, I said, okay, fine. You know, this guy seems really cool. He gets it. You know, talking about the cop. I said, all right, uh, where is he? And he says, we think it's, he's in Mexico. And I'm like, oh, I've never, I don't speak Spanish. I've never looked for somebody in Mexico before. And I said, well, where in Mexico? And they said, uh, Mazatlan or Puerto Vallarta. And I said, okay, all right. What does he look like? And he sent me a picture of what he looked like. And he's like a really white, red haired guy. And I said, okay, this might be, Scottish, this might be it? easy. <laughs> hey, might even, yeah. And I said, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb in Mexico. So I said, okay. So I, I, um, I did two ads in Puerto Vallarta and Mazatlan. And, um, did them around, I would find like the Hooters, you know, cause like, all right, this is an American. Where would he go? He'd be around like, where would Tell they have bus. Hooters? Yeah. So and then I, I, I put it up and I swear within 30 minutes, I got so many people who knew this guy and everybody, you talk about rewards. I learned the word very quickly for reward in Spanish, which is recompensa. You know, they were constantly, it was a recompensa, recompensa. And the, um, he, once the heat got turned on, he left, uh, and then we were tracking him and I found a lot of different people who knew him. Eventually we found him and we got him. And sure enough, just because it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of corruption down there. When he got taken in, he asked the police, he said, what are they, uh, what's my reward? And they, they told him, and then he said, I'll double it, but they didn't do it. You know, they did the right thing, but usually that's a lot of times that's what happens is that the police or the federalities or whatever will they'll get the money back mm -hmm. you know from the guy whoever it is um so yeah the rewards ob obviously are a, are a big thing i i had one though where a guy i don't know if he got the reward or not but it was a it was a romantic rival you know and he knew who the guy was because he had gone out with the guy's mm -hmm. girlfriend previously so there's always going to be you know mm -hmm. stuff like that what makes a good detective talking to people you know that's the biggest thing and being open to people yeah communication is is what makes you know a, really a, a good a lot of you know different things it certainly is the most important thing for being a journalist you mm -hmm. know even more than writing skill or anything like that it's talking to as many people as possible mm -hmm. you know you have to be out there talking what was the is it golden state one what was the mothers of the little girls 
The Golden State Killer? Yeah. Yeah. Did he kill young kids as well? No, he killed, no, he killed women uh, and then men, um, you, know, you know, and he started out as a peeping Tom and then he escalated towards rape and then he escalated towards rape and murder um, once, you know, and then he, once he was, he was sort of potentially identified, he said, all right, I've got to start killing these people. And then once uh, we think, as I certainly think that, the the first DNA case, uh, which was over here actually, um, for catching a, a killer. Once he heard that information, he he stopped. We think you know he could have kept going, but uh, did he not get caught? No, he got caught. Yeah, well, yeah. he got caught in 2018. He was alive. It was amazing. You know, we thought maybe he's dead. We we knew they were going to catch him because they had his DNA. They had a lot of his DNA. So unless he was adopted, they would be able to catch him with the familial DNA, which is. You know, like uh, if you ever did 23andMe or Ancestry.com where you spit in a tube, the police can't access that database, but you can take your data, your information, and then put it into another database. Uh, GEDmatch is one of them. And then it, the police can access that, and then they can find his, you know, a sister of his or a brother or a great uncle, and then try and narrow it down and figure out who this is. And that's how they're catching a lot of the old serial killers in America right now mm -hmm. is through that. Yeah. So that's the way that they were able to, uh, to catch that guy. Who is America's biggest serial killer? You know, there's a guy named Henry Lee Lucas and you talk about possible bullshit, you know, um, he says he killed over 200, you know, um, we don't know whether to um, believe him or not. Um, um, there was another, uh, guy, uh, who had, um, and this, this, this is telling cause I can't re quite remember his name, but he was a black guy and he was killing, uh, people all across the country. And, um, um, you know, he, but he killed a lot of black women and a lot of, uh, sex workers and, and that sort of thing. So nobody really paid attention to him and he got caught and nobody really cared. Yeah. We've got Harold Shipman. He's a, with a doctor. He killed hundreds. Mm -hmm. Fucking hundreds of people. He was injecting people. Oh, uh, we, we, like a uh, angel of death type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Scary that, isn't it? He's a fucking doctor. Mm -hmm. You expect serial killers to be look like monsters like you say, but he was a doctor, man. Yeah. And just people are putting his trust in him and they don't actually know the number. Mm -hmm. Could be fucking thousands. Yeah. Here, So here's that. This is that. Um, What one's this? This is the the kid in uh, in Philadelphia. See the guy just walking right past him. Mm -hmm. Just walks right past him. Imagine that you're just walking down the street. This guy just turns around, shoots you in the back of the head, and then he runs away. And then, yeah, so it's pretty decent, you know. Like yeah, he's wearing a, a a mask, but you've got you know you've got his build. You have got the way he walks. The way he holds his gun. So he, was that a, a hit or was that just a random one? The only, it, you don't, this that, was that like, a, this was like random. a, like, like, and, and Everett, Everett's family. I mean this with all, all due respect and love. Everett was, he was kind of a geeky kid. You know, he, he was coming back from a, uh, like a board game night at a, at a bar. You know, this was not a kid that was probably involved with anything here. So, um, uh, it you know it might have been you used to hear these stories all the time of people that were uh, like gang initiations. You got to go and kill somebody in order to be part of the gangs, and that's kind of like what it looks like. They don't really do that anymore, but it's still potentially a thing. So I don't I don't know. I'm not sure. Just walking by someone, random, gun. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, where was this? New York. That's Philly. Philly's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fucking crazy there. I yeah. know people from there. They say it's, it's one of the worst in America, yeah. if not the worst. Yeah, Philly is, uh, I mean, those, uh, you know, it's, those are a, a hard group of people right there. Tough you bastards, know? aren't they? Yeah. But then cowards for doing that as well, you know, but why is it? Yeah, it's strange because even the addiction, like success leaves clues. Portugal dropped down the numbers of heroin addicts. Yeah. Basically instantly, yeah. just by making a few adjustments and, why we don't follow suit and change the laws and change regulations to then fit in um, and make the world a better place? It puzzles me. Yeah, when I when I was working on my latest book, um, which is about the opioid addiction, it, it's about these women who in 
Ohio, and it really is all across the country, um, but who get addicted to heroin, um, they, or get addicted to the pain pills. And that's what, that's how it started. Pain pills get taken away. They have to go to heroin. Then they, the heroin dries up because they they don't have any money. So then they have to sell their bodies and this was happening. And then a lot of them were getting killed or were overdosing and their bodies were being dumped. And, uh, the book's called killers amidst killers. The, what happens is, is that, uh, you'd have a lot of dumpings. They changed the law um, a Samaritan law that says, you know, if you bring a overdose victim to a, a hospital, you won't get arrested because it used to be that they would arrest that person, you know, so that's why they would just dump a body wherever, but nobody was fine, you know, looking for these women. And, um, the, the amount of, um, the people that I talked to and talking about the Portugal model of, um, and, and how much that, uh, has gone down, you know, I was doing, I would interview these women at uh, halfway houses. And one of them was talking about how, um, you know, she, she had been dead, uh, clinically dead. Um, they had, she said they had the body bag out for me. She said, I've saved friends before. And, and I said, well, you know, do you carry around? Does everybody carry around Narcan? And she said, no. And I said, why not? And she said, cause we're all just tired, you know, and they're really, a lot of them are just playing Russian roulette. And just saying, like, if I die, if it's my time, it's my time, you know, and it's such a devastating thing to hear. Just I'm just tired, you know, and the and that book was written really about the heroin and fentanyl was just starting to pick up. Now that fentanyl is everywhere. It's in everything. Don't you know, it used to be when fentanyl was really starting to pick up. Don't do heroin because it could have fentanyl in it. Then it was don't do coke because it could have fentanyl in it. And there's a lot of people that would just do, do a line at a party and then die. Now it's never take a pill that somebody gives you. So if you're at a party and somebody gives you a Vicodin, you know, it looks like, oh, they probably got it from a doctor or whatever. It looks official. It's got the markings on it and everything. And then somebody dies. And there's so many of those stories. And so many people have reached out to me saying, my daughter was at a party. Somebody gave her a Xanax and it turns out it was, there was fentanyl in it. And then she died. You know, you only need, there's a, gr- a great image that one of the police departments did of the amount of heroin that would kill you and the amount of fentanyl that'll kill you. And the fentanyl, it's like little, you know, like Point it looks one. like it's eight, yeah. eight little, you know, grains of, uh, of so, sand, yeah. you know? It's sad, man. It's scary as well. But that serial killer's working. We used to have street Valium here that was killed thousands mm-hmm. of people. Because that's what the addicts wanted to try and get asleep or try and take the edge off. They'd yeah. Maybe take 10 Valium, 20 Valium. Um, but it was laced with something. Some people say rat poison, other people say other things. But people were genuinely making it to kill people. Yeah. Same as with the fact they're putting it in everything to well, kill people. Somebody's getting a kick from that. Yeah. I don't think they're new, really doing I think they're doing it just to, to, just to augment the. the I don't like think they're high. doing it to kill people. They're to augment the high. But these aren't fucking, you know, MIT chemists. Yeah. You know, these are these are people that are um, making it in their basement. Yeah. And you know, the heroin. There was a barrier of entry for heroin because you had to have the poppy, and the poppy was grown in Afghanistan or whatever. And then you had to bring the poppy over, and and with fentanyl, you can make it in a in a lab. You know, and uh, it's also cheap. You've got the blues, and I do you know outreach work, and you know we give we go to parks. Uh, and give away, you know, sneakers and that kind of thing for the people that are there. And, you know, they're talking about how, yeah, you can get a a blue now for $2, like in Arizona. They don't last very long, so you got to get 20 of them a day. But it's very easy to to get them, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, those are the people that actually are asking for the the blues and they're everywhere and they're, they're, they're just, it's a monumental problem in America. It's probably... I think it's the biggest uh, uh, problem in America in terms of definitely in terms of drugs, but in terms of uh, anything else. But again, it's it's interesting because you're starting to see a lot of people know other people who who have died from fentanyl. So it's not just a sex worker that nobody cares about. Yeah. So maybe something will be done, but yeah, it's took over crystal meth. Huh? Yeah, it's definitely taken over crystal meth. Two different types of drugs, but you'll see that you know crystal meth again, very much a white 
white drug, you know, um, poor white drug, you know? So obviously in America we had in the eighties, we had cocaine, um, as like the big, you know, scourge, but that was an expensive drug that was rich white people. Uh, then you had crack, which was poor black people. And then you had crystal meth, which was uh, poor white people. And now you have fentanyl, which seemingly is everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Cause it's cheaper as well. Mm -hmm. And people are still getting a hit from it. Sad. Mm -hmm. I watched the documentary on Netflix. I don't know if it was in Canada or LA. I can't remember, but it looks like a zombie a apocalypse. Yeah. Just fucking yeah. scary. Well, there was video actually of in Philadelphia, um, underneath yeah, a place called Philly. Kensington. Yeah. Of, you know, and a lot of people will just be passed out standing up, mm -hmm. you know, and you've got, and I carry Narcan around with me too. And it's just, you know, what you've got to do is if you see somebody that is not so much standing up, they would have fallen down if they died. But if they're out, you know, uh, trying to figure out if they are, you know, if they do need help and, you know, you do the, the Spock pinch on them or you rub their chest and, and hard to see if they'll wake up. And if they don't wake up, just administer that Narcan. It can't hurt you, you know. What is in fentanyl? Was it a, a higher dose of heroin? A hundred times stronger than heroin? What is that? It's a hundred times stronger than, um, uh, what did they used to give people? And it, it, it's escaping me. Like, when, you know, um, it's not Valium. It's, it's, um, Oh, yeah, we used to get, they used to drink the liquid up in Scotland, see it in prisons and stuff. They used to give them that mm -hmm. as a replacement for heroin, methadone. Well, that was methadone, but just like the typical, um, what you would get in, I can't believe I'm, I'm forgetting it. What everybody's probably yelling at the screen now, but <laughs> they, uh, they, they, um, uh, they say it's a hundred times stronger than, than that, than the typical thing that you would get in a hospital, you know, you know, um, the, yeah, the drip, pop, the drip that yeah, you would get in the, the hospital. Poppy yeah. field where it's full of... Yeah. Um, or oh, morphine. Morphine. Fuck That's sick. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> morphine. Yeah, Jeez. morphine. Yeah. Morphine. Uh, yeah, they say they say it's a hundred times stronger than morphine. It just takes that pain all. away then, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's, you know, it's just people... You know, you have a lot different, obviously, when, when you're, you're uh, an addict. And, you know, I wrote the book... Um, not in recovery, you know, but then I, I've been promoting it in recovery. So it's like, it's different, you know, and you start thinking about, about, um, the things, um, that you learn in recovery and how, uh, you know, AA and, and NA are, are, can help a lot of people, but it's certainly, it's not for everybody. Yeah. You know? What's the one murder that sticks out in your mind? The murder that sticks out in my mind, man. Um, God, there's just, uh, there's just so many of them, you know, the, the, uh, Probably my, my white whale is that one in Brooklyn. There's another one, um, uh, which I call the girl with the dragon tattoo, which I was trying to, um, trying to solve. Uh, there's, there's, I can actually show you her. There's the, this, this, this girl right there. She was, you know, they were going to do heroin together. This is in Tampa. And she looks like she's digging in her bag. The police think she's probably digging in for a gun. And she shoots this guy, you know, and nobody really cared, you know, just another junkie that was shot, but I still want to solve it. So she shot him? Yeah, she shot him. To steal his drugs or? Uh, we don't know. You know, it might've been that. It might've been, you know, it potentially could have been self-defense. Who knows? But, you know, Yeah. So I don't, you know. Why is she, uh, is she taking her time? Yeah. And you see that tattoo, like zooming in on that tattoo and interviewing so many different tattoo artists and things. And, and. Did she show? Mm. Is that hot? Where did they go? They, they went to go shoot up. So they don't, you don't see the murder. Yeah. But you see the, um, the guy. So, so this is how long is this? No, that that's that's not that one. I'll show you the. Uh... Yeah, as far as murders go, the murder that that sticks with me, I, I definitely want to see. There's a murder that this guy who I think was the worst serial killer ever. Um, the bear a guy named Terry Rasmussen. And I had been working on this case for a while and it wasn't, I tried doing the internet, you know, this, the stuff that I do with social media is, is, is different. That was an older case. It's hard to use social media with trying to find old people. But this, what this guy would do is he would cozy up to a woman who had a kid. He would molest the kid, 
kill the woman and then use the kid as a lure to meet another woman and their kid and then kill the first kid and then do the cycle again. We think he did that like at least two times, which is the worst thing you can think of. I don't think you can hit any, any, anybody worse than that. And eventually he was caught. So trying to see if, if he had been, you know, uh, he had killed anybody else. You know, you, you look at the, in America, at least, um, you know, the big unsolved murders in America, obviously John Benet is, is probably the biggest. When you look at the, some people would say JFK is the biggest, but I think Oswald did it. Uh, you know, and obviously we know OJ killed Nicole and, and, uh, and Ron Goldman. So that's the big one. You know, you look over here, even yesterday, I picked up the paper on the Metro, you know, they're still, still talking about Maddie's case, you know? Um, and then, you know, um, Jill, uh, the, um, Jill Dando. Jill Dando. Yeah. I mean, that's the one, if I was over here, because I'm a journalist too, and having a journalist be murdered, that's what, that's probably one of the biggest unsolved ones here. Other than obviously Jack the Ripper, which is the biggest. Yeah. We had one in Scotland, Bible John. Mm -hmm. He used to wear yeah. nightclubs. Bible John was bit, yep. Yeah, but they think that was a police officer. Mm -hmm. That's why he got away with so much, because he had inside information. Yeah. So he could be able to cover his own tracks. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got, you know, over here you have, um, you know, first learning about, I think I maybe first learned about the Moore's murders from the Smith song, mm -hmm. Suffer Little Children, and just like, what he, what is he talking about? And, um and you know those are you know you, when you see those those type of killers like the man and woman killer you know uh, there was one up in in Canada called the the Ken and Barbie killers the same it's kind of similar thing well, they, they were killing they see killed I like them. the Bonnie and Clyde story mm -hmm. well that's I, a little bit yeah yeah that's old school but mm -hmm. it's uh, you still gravitate towards that kind of in a relationship kind of ride or die mentality robbing banks yeah. killing people it's sexy. No yeah, matter what well, way you fucking look at it, it's crazy, yeah. it's barbaric, but there's something appealing to it. So. Well, you, with Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. I mean, it's it's there's a fantasy in everybody's head of doing that. You know, I yeah. mean, obviously, nobody wants, not everybody wants to kill somebody, but being outlaws on the run, and I've been near that Bonnie and Clyde car, at least maybe it was the one that was used in the movie, but it was, it's something that, this very sort of, you know, freeing, uh, especially mm -hmm. and very American too, you know, the American from the old West stories and everything, you know, um, you had the penny dreadfuls over here, but at the same time, a little bit before that you had the old West, um, penny novels, uh, over in, in America where we learned about Billy, the kid and, and Jesse James. And those were mythologized, you know, uh, in America. Was and, Jesse James Australian? No, he was American. American. Yeah. What was the one with um, Bye Bye Blackbird, they used to say? Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. I don't, he played the gangster. He played Dillinger. Dillinger. Yeah. Dillinger. Yeah. Um, he ended up getting killed as well. Yeah. Well, he yes. Dead like Dillinger. Yep. Great yeah. movie as well, yeah. man. Johnny so, Depp's a great act. What do you think of the Madeline McCann case from your own perspective? Have you looked into it? <laughs> I mean, just as a, as a casual observer looking into it, obviously it's a horrible case, uh, you know, for a family, um, you know, you're going to dine, you know, what was it? 200 yards away or something. You kind of have eyes on the room. There's other kids in the room. You're thinking nothing's going to happen. Um, I think the family obviously has been put through, you know, hell, um, with a lot of people blaming them for this or that, which is wrong. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's just, it, it's one of the, you know, they call that really a locked door mystery, you know, like from uh, Sherlock Holmes days, you know, that, that when there's a murder that happens, but the doors are locked, like what could have happened? And uh, it's kind of, kind of similar to it. Um, somebody comes in, takes her, nobody sees really anything. Um, you know, they have this guy that they're thinking maybe there's always a chance something could be solved. Um, all, you, you can never give up on it. And that's probably my biggest you know, the thing that I was, I was always raised with from my dad was persistence and never giving up on stuff. It's like Batman says, when someone asks Batman, what, what's your superpower is it's, it's, I never give up, you know? So that's, that's one of the things that I sort of yeah, go off Such on. a big case and people have always got their say, especially what we look at it is here is because people say it's abandonment, leaving the kids in an apartment and a holder resort at 7 PM and 
they discredited the dog, the best sniffer dog in the world, mm -hmm. because it smelt blood in the apartment and in the boot of the car. Mm -hmm. And and they were washing, they were playing tennis the next day. People deal with trauma differently, so we can't. It doesn't mean anything, but they'd wash the teddy bear, the little girl teddy bear, three days later. I know people who's hmm. got missing kids who don't even fucking touch the room touch ten, the room. twenty years yeah. later. So he's got links to high profile people as well. There's a photo of the wall wearing red shoes, which has a link to kind of secret society. Mm -hmm. It was a doctor as well at a Celtic football club. Um, yeah, and no, none of the family members or friends that were there at that evening have ever gave an interview either. That's yeah, that's um, weird. So yeah. if you are screaming from the rooftops about this missing kid, why they not all fucking screaming from it instead mm -hmm. of the public? So every, it's messy that situation. But yeah. like I say, he was a doctor. Maybe he sees death every other day, every day. He's just kind of cold to it. Yeah. But I've interviewed people who are still get distressed in their face twenty years later from losing a loved one. So. That is messy. Um, some people say, and I'm speculating here, but some people do say that they drugged the kids to make them fall asleep. The rumour is that the young girl fell off the bed and mm. passed away. Mm -hmm. That's where the smell of blood came from. Um, and he's got rid of the body, the father. Mm -hmm. But where, I don't know. And yeah, there's so many different rumours. I know that there's a German guy who there was who was a suspect, but again, I think there's been no evidence whatsoever. Um, yeah. But why does some cases get so much media attention and the others don't? You're you're always going to see, uh, especially in in Western culture, the biggest cases are going to have a white female victim, no matter what. You know, uh, putting aside the JFK case, you know, uh, but um, when you have a white female victim, that's considered that's the perfect victim. In in you know that's what monster movies are made out of. You know that's what every the the old um, guy tying a uh, maiden to the uh, with the mustache tying a, a girl to the train tracks. That is the archetype that we've been handed. Um, and even with Jack the Ripper, you know it's it's kind of ironic that we don't care about women that are um, are sex workers who are murdered. But when, meanwhile, the entire genre was started by a guy who was murdering some sex workers, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, Jack the Ripper, the whole, um, it, it has. So when you look at the, the big cases in history, um, obviously you've got Maddie, you've got John Benet. Those are female uh, victims. You've got, um, OJ, uh, that was big cause it was a celebrity. I mean, that was a perfect storm celebrity, pretty white woman, you know, um, Gabby Petito, um, over there, which was a big case over there. Um, and you've got, uh, that's all, what it's, it's always has been. And that's what the, um, you know, my first book, the crimes that I wrote about were white men of color who were not gay. You know what I mean? You, you I, don't think, I don't think there's ever been a best selling book about that other than my book of, of like writing about some of those cases that, um, never really get any ink. Um, it's just, oh, you know what? It's a white, you know, it's a man of color who died on the street. Um, so be it. But when it's a, um, a female victim who's not a sex worker, uh, that is, that you know, the the woman that was killed in Owlshead Park. One of the reasons why that didn't get a lot of play is that, uh, and she was a sex worker too. You know, what about Michael Jordan's dad? Michael Jordan's dad. I don't know what was going on there. Some weird one on it though. Um, yeah, yeah. Apparently, he pulled over to. Uh, take a, take a nap on the side of the road, which they tell you to do, um, which, uh, if you're, if you're tired and, um, these two kids, uh, robbed him and killed him and took his car. I think that was, that was the, it. Yeah. So then you're going to have a lot of speculation there. You're always going to see in general, it, I've always wanted, you know, how much of a conspiratorial mind was there in the Roman days? Like how much were, were we always like this or did this really just start with, um, and on that, you know, in the, JFK's murder, obviously with the UFOs, you know, we love conspiracy theories and we gravitate towards them. I'm an Occam's razor guy. I'm the, the, which is commonly said as being the simplest explanation is the best one. What really it is, is uh, the explanation that has the least amount of assumptions is the best one, you know? So, you know, when you look at John Benet of either somebody killed her that was in the house or somebody 
came from outside and killed her and then left that note that had information in it that had that, that was about that had a lot of things to do with the the father's bonus and all these other things that you know what there's less assumptions to saying that it happened from the people in the house but you know anything could have happened but that's usually where i lean on and um you know you saw that with you know, the serial case as well which um was a, a big case in america because of the podcast um a lot of people trying to come up with these theories that you really have to make so many different assumptions because we're all kind of detectives in our own little way yeah and we just sometimes get it totally wrong yeah do you know what i'm saying because we do get that's why i always tell people to question everything obviously i think people question it more now more conspiracy route because of the lies that has been proven bullshit from years ago from mm -hmm. The government, what they've said and what the media have said, a lot of fucking misinformation. It has been exposed as well. well so yeah, it does waken people up and they end up paranoid. I mean, some of the the biggest thing here, Hillsborough, you know, yeah. it was such a a um, you know, and the media was complicit in that. Uh, if you want to refer to the Sun as media, but it's like, you know, you had um, a, you know, it's been able to be fixed then, but they were saying that oh no, these were. These were fans that were unruly and they were drunk and this is why it happened. And meanwhile, it was a fault of the construction of, the, you know, the, the way that they let people into the pen and uh, not having safety, you know, guards there and um, um, to be able to have those people. I mean, what a horrible way to die being crushed like that and then having the indignity of, say, of doing you know, blood tests after just to try and prove that somebody might have been, you know, drunk or not. Madness, but the Scousers still hate the son for that. Oh, yeah. Because they were saying they were um, going through people's pockets and this and that. And, and yeah. rightly fucking so, they they went, they spoke some shit and you're not, you, you, they don't sell the son in Liverpool anymore. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I can understand why. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's and just. The Scousers don't forget. So it, the media are, are bastards now. I think they've, kind of loosened it up a little bit more i kind of think they're thinking of people's well-being mm -hmm. um because back in the day the media kill people they yeah. still do to a certain degree but not as it was yeah. 70s 80s 90s 2000 yeah when i was uh it, when everybody was contacting us for a golden state killer case that i remember the son contacted me and i told him to go to hell just yeah. because of that i'm not even i'm actually a manchester city fan but it's like I know that story and know that what they, what they did there. And it's yeah. still, it's like, uh, I mean, eventually, you know, but I, it's, it's, it is what it is. That's, that's, if you're working at the sun, that's where you're, that's where your head's at, you know? And, um, you know, a lot of that kind of journalism has moved over, you know, you see the daily mail over in America, in America, just because of online and the sun has come over to America as well. And they're all written in the same style. And, you know, mm -hmm. the New York post, we have the New York post over there, mm -hmm. but I don't think the New York post used to, I worked for the New York Post for one story and I didn't like it. And um, uh, I never worked for them again. But they were, uh, uh, you know, that's that's what the you know, New York Post is famous for, Headless Body and Topless Bar. That was a great headline that they did. Yeah, so. What was that? It was called Headless, but there, there was a, a, a body without a head found in a topless bar. And their headline was Headless Body and Topless Bar, which is like a famous headline that you have. But yeah. it's clickbait with a lot of them. Oh, yeah, now it's that. clickbait. They're trying yeah. to get... The now it's, it's a lot of clickbait. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot and of it's bullshit. And you can't even make any money on the web now. You know, yeah. it's not like you're, you're making, you know, a cent that, you know, it's just the CPMs are so low right now that clickbait doesn't even really mean anything. It's all about, you know, potentially getting a subscription. I know? think everybody's going down this route of kind of YouTube and everybody's what about YouTuber and good luck to them. There is money to be made, but it is consistency and it is, takes up a lot of time. But what do you think of the JFK murder? Because I had Michael Francesi on. He says the mafia were behind it. <laughs> Michael Francesi, huh? All right. Um, I used to think the, the mafia was behind it. Uh, as a kid, again, Occam's Razor the least amount of assumptions that you have to make for your theory. Uh, we know it, 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 Oswald is placed there. Obviously he worked there. Oswald definitely was up there with the rifle. We knew the rifle that he had and everything like that. A lot of things need to be assumed in order to say that he didn't do it. The gun was planted, this or that, the other thing. 
um, Oswald had taken a shot at Edwin Walker, who is a conservative. This is, Oswald was all over the place in terms of his mindset. He was wanted to kill conservatives. He was a lefty. He wanted to be really a secret agent. That's what he wanted to be at the end of the day. Um, he really had kind of delusions of grandeur. And he went and um, tried to shoot this guy. Um, he was a he he shot him through the he hit the window pane, um, missed him from really short wells away. He got lucky. He was up there. It, it was a uh, decent shot. That the it was going very slow. The um, you know you can't have a conspiracy with that many people without you know getting real tangible information. You know, you can watch the videos, you can look around for shadows. There's this, if you look at the, um, one of the pictures, I think the Mormon photograph, you see this man that's called a badge man that you think is a guy on the grassy knoll and he's got a badge, and, but it's really, it's smoking. You know what I mean? It's just, it's all that. Because it says someone can, came from one of the drains under the ground. There's, there's the drain on the, the ground. And the boot, what we call it here in the, the, the boot in the trunk. In the trunk. <laughs> yeah. No. The I will give one percent chance that he might have been killed by a Secret Service agent by accident behind him in the car. There is the one guy; he was one of his first jobs. He might have fallen, and there's been a whole documentary on that. There's a possibility that the kill shot might have been that, and um, but Oswald was definitely up there. I don't think it was the mafia. Um, I don't think it was it was any of that. So. What do you think of Biggie and Tupac murders? Have you ever looked into that? Uh, Tupac. Um, I think, you know, Tupac got into that, that beef with Orlando uh, who, who, at the um, at the casino right before that. And I think um, that was the guy that, that shot him, you know. Because someone's in now. He's done podcasts saying he was there, he was driving, mm -hmm. and now he's in now. I just don't get that. Like, the police don't forget. Don't yeah. think because you've released a book, okay, you've got an all clear. Yeah. I don't know if it was Las Vegas he was in, and they kind of gave him, like, a pardon so, but now if he's looking at life. Really? Yeah. yeah. Keefy D. So, yeah, it's just, uh, Tupac, they pretty much know. Um, Biggie is different, you know, because Biggie, you, there's a lot of stories about Biggie on who could have done that. Um, apparently it was a guy with a bow tie, you know, maybe trying to say it was a Nation of Islam thing or somebody trying to look like Nation of Islam. That was a that's a rough one. Um, but Pete yeah. Diddy, look at all the shit that's coming out about him now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's one for watching, and he's had question marks over his head because he apparently wanted to be number one. Because I had Big Gene on, who was P Diddy's bodyguard. Yeah, and P Diddy says one time, Tupac needs to go, Suge Knight needs to go, and Biggie needs to go. Huh. Um, because Biggie was doing his own thing with the music rights. Mm -hmm. And Puffy was getting all the money, so Biggie was making music, but putting other people's names. So yeah. Puffy wouldn't get anything. Uh, it's messy with all them. Mm -hmm. um, will we ever get answers? I don't know. Yeah, but, I just I just wish somebody would come out with a bunch of Biggie songs where they can actually remove, you know, Puffy in the background when he, exactly. when he just goes, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. Just take that stuff yeah. out. So when I'm listening to, you know, um, Juicy or, or any of those songs, I don't have to hear uh, yeah. Puffy. But uh, but yeah, and I thought that before all this stuff came out. I was just like, why does he got to ruin the song? But yeah, he That's wanted to be. Shit, especially with the, the video footage now with Cassie and beating her at the elevator. Yeah. Um, Justin Bieber being young in his presence, 13. Usher, 14. It is weird, but if you're a producer, you still go up. Maybe he was trying to help them for their music. So you can't just jump to conclusions as well, but there seems to be a lot of dark stuff there. So time will tell, I believe. Yeah, I think he's going to prison, man. I mm -hmm. think he could be the next R. Kelly. Well, you don't see, yeah, if he doesn't run. I mean, you kept on thinking that he might he might go someplace. And, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, Russell Simmons is, uh, is out there somewhere, you know. Yeah. But it's... uh. Yeah, it's, you know, all of these uh, stories, you know, that had come out because the um, New York had changed the law for a year that you could you you could sue um, for or bring charges or sue um, for a case that would have been uh, against uh, over the um, statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those cases came out about Puffy because of that. Yeah. yeah, I think with the elevator footage, because it was six years old or eight years old, they can't charge him. Mm hmm which is fucking madness. Yeah. There shouldn't be any time limit on anything, but mm -hmm. apparently that's why it's out now because it's so old that 
they can't do anything with it. Yeah. Um, so you've solved ten murders. What's the biggest one you've solved? I would say I would say probably the uh, you know the first one, the Marcus Gaines one. Let me show you. Let me show you that one too, actually, because this one was so that's Marcus at the store. So he's in a Seven Eleven. He leaves the Seven Eleven, and uh, you know he's definitely a little tipsy. He's had some drinks. The guy that eventually attacks him tries to go in the Seven Eleven, and then the the security guard kind of kicks him out. And um, yeah, there he is right there. So then you've got um, you know Marcus Gaines, who's the victim. He goes outside and is confronted by this guy. Um, the, I don't know what the beef was about, but you could tell by his mannerisms, he's just sort of saying, what did I do? You know, just, just you know, just chill out, that kind of thing. And then he walks away and then you see him, you see him walking away and then he gets popped. See that? Punched or short? Yeah. Punched? Punched. And see the people right there? They're going through his pockets. They were they were watching this thing from across the street. And they thought maybe they were involved with him or not, but they were watching it. They went through his pockets, you know, like his phone, that kind of thing. Well, they're just addicts. Yeah, something. I don't know. I don't know what they were doing. They went through his pockets so fast. Yeah. I mean, it was instantaneous. You know. And he died with that punch. Well, no, no, no. Here, let me show you. I gotta just fast forward a little bit. So here. what happened? So you you've got those people that are around him. Mm-hmm. So he gets up? No, he doesn't get up. Look. look. Yeah, he's his chest bone up and down. Oh, okay. No, sir, he's his chest bone up and down. Oh, okay. So, but he's not, 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 Not tight. Calves can rent the phone on drive over the top. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. How did they end up driving over them? You can tell in the video, it's it sort of somebody had stopped, and then there was another the, the cop behind him or the uh, the taxi behind him tried to go around him and didn't really see anything. So he was being impatient. He went around him and then made that so he couldn't see anything. And remember, he's in the street. His attacker had yelled at everybody not to help him or they would be next kind of thing. And he's a big dude. So he's probably like 6'4", you know, 250, 260. And then um, the cab just rolled right over him and killed him. So that poor bastard was alive and then the cab drove over him and killed him? Mm-hmm. That's some bad luck, Matt. Yeah. That's some mighty bad luck. I mean, that was just, you encounter the wrong dude, you know, and then. And how long did it take to catch him? That took, I, uh, I saw, it had been about four months when I saw, and they hadn't caught him when I saw the video. I started it. I got his name within two weeks and then um, went to Chicago. Definitely ID'd him, although he wasn't there, but I ID'd him amongst people. Gave the info to the police about about a month later after that, and then it took about four months for the police to get him. Does your life become in danger by nah, catching I don't these people? I, don't have, I you know I I I did have an armed guard for my first book tour, uh, especially up in Chicago. You know, just because he's from Chicago. But the cop once told me, "You got to be a, you got to watch out for the um, don't watch out for the, the don't be afraid or don't worry." about the bullet with your name on it be worried about the thousand bullets without your name on it you know so it's it, you're more apt to find your your demise through something it's on the street or it, yeah, exa you. exactly yeah so but you know knocking on doors and you know i've always been a very sort of confrontational person particularly with, with the police you know this is one 
uh, with there was a lot of corruption that was going on for the Long Island serial killer case in the Long Island. That was one of the reasons why it wasn't solved to begin with, it, other than also bad police work and, you know, knocking on the door of the police chief, the former police chief who had been who had been arrested for corruption and civil rights violations and things. And it never really goes through my mind that oh, I can get shot through the door or anything like that. You know, um, usually if you're working, I did that for a TV show. If you're working for a TV show, they'll always be like, no, if you go there, you know, we don't want you dying and your family suing us. So, mm-hmm. um, but I mean, I did a lot of stuff when I was just working in print and newspapers where, you know, you're interview you're going into weird neighborhoods or interviewing people and potentially, mm-hmm. you know, contacting people that might have killed somebody 20 years ago that you want to, you're trying to get information out of. And then, you know, they find you somehow or they contact you at your home or things. So, yeah. So, see, when you start doing that and you get five convictions, six convictions, can you ever switch off then? Because you know you can actually catch killers and then it just comes too much pressure where you're chasing, you're chasing a, a never ending number. It's a limitless number you're chasing. You're never going to solve every That's... crime on the planet. So how do you separate, try to live a life and then try to solve murders, which yeah. is a dark and depressing? That's the thing that gets to you. It's never, if anything led me to drink more or whatever, it would have been that. It would have been turning it off not knowing that I could, all right, I'm going to eat this steak. I could have spent for this $50 I spent on this steak. I could have bought $50 worth of ads for that. You know what I mean? Just doing that math in my head. You know, it's like as a kid, I would always be, I remember working at a sporting goods store and it was like, okay, if I work three hours, I can buy a CD. You know, I could buy the Colts Love CD, you know, that kind of thing. I would always put that in my head. So it's like that. And then also knowing that it's this, task of sisyphus where you're rolling the ball up the hill and it's never gonna it's never gonna get up there you're constantly adding more and more murders up there and um trying to and some police have used this i wish more would i wish you know facebook would give police a bunch of free ads to do this but they don't want their their platform being you know filled with murders i get that but um yeah it definitely does it it it, that's the thing that takes its toll is just knowing, and I've always been such a big, you know, numbers guy with sports and trying to figure things out with numbers and just knowing just like, yeah, I solved one of these, but there's 16,000 more that are going to happen this year and 8,000 of them are going to be unsolved. You know? So how many people get killed in America a year again? Yeah. It was, it was down to 15 for, and then, um, post pandemic it got up. And so it's about 17 now, you know, mm. but it's, it, the murder rate had gone down a lot and it's not where it was. Nineties was the worst, you know, uh, cause you still had crack going on and everything. So, um, you know, you've got a lot of gangs, you've got a lot of the El Salvadoran gangs that are there now, and um, they're very organized. And you don't have, you know, the mafia acted a little bit in those cities as a police force, you know, so, but now with the mafia, uh, a lot of it has gone. Um, I've got family members who have since passed away that were connected. They would hate the fact that I'm calling it the mafia. They've just, that thing of theirs. Um, it had, uh, they you know, they acted as like, you don't mess around in our neighborhood, that kind of thing. But obviously that's all, that's all yeah. kind of changed. No drugs, don't harm women, kids. That kind of, yeah. A little bit of a code there. Yeah. yeah that's all fucking changed, man. Mm-hmm. There's no code anymore. Yeah. What, what's a good platform to use for your detective work? Is it Facebook, your main one? Facebook was so good back then. You know, when I started doing it, 2016, everybody was still on it. Now, so many people have have gotten off of Facebook, unfortunately, especially young people. It's still anybody over 40, they'll still check it. A lot of people use Facebook now just for Facebook groups or something. Um, It's not as ubiquitous as it was. Twitter, use a little bit. Um, Starting to get into TikTok, it's a lot harder to do the ads and everything. Um, You know, I was, uh, I would do ads on on Snapchat, you know, uh, you could sort of um, t- really geo target v- very well on there, but it's just, it, it used to be, you know, before in America, we used to have three channels, you know, we had ABC, NBC, CBS, and maybe a local one local channel. So, um, if you were in a town in 1984 and, and somebody showed you one of these videos, odds are you're going to see it, you know, now with nobody watching TV and everything and the media is so stratified, you're not going to see this stuff. So, the great thing is, is that 
using social media and geo targeting it like with that um the case of the guy with the uh the mask and the halloween mask in el monte um you know tar i i think i hit 80 percent of the people that are in el monte and one other town so everybody in that town saw that that ad you wouldn't have got that even if i had it on every television station you know you wouldn't have got that if taylor swift posted it you know it's just it's a matter of going to where people are showing it to them enticing them, you know, cause I'm a writer. So I'm enticing them with a headline and, 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 and a good video that's going to get their attention, have them write to you, write them back right away, try to get tips and work them and then give them to the police. When did the alcohol take its toll? <sighs> you know, as a writer, you, you like to think that alcohol is the thing that you use to write better. And, uh, you know, I really started heavily drinking around 34 as newspapers were going down, you know, I always considered myself a newspaper man and it was really very much my identity. And they, I was still, I was at the top of the newspaper game, but I saw that it was going, it was, it was not doing well. And the iceberg, we had already hit the iceberg. We were just sinking. So, um, you know, high pressure environments. And then, you know, as I kept going and going, it just got, you know, worse and worse. And, you know, my mother was, a, was an alcoholic. She was in the program for 10 years my dad um was a uh was a heroin addict he kicked that but then he he was really into uh beer and um and pills darvon he used to take a lot of what's that darvon it's like valium or um or Vi more like vicodin i would say uh, yeah uh, well not antidepressants just just op like opioids yeah so he would take those and he would um you know he would drink you know that we would take one of those and have three beers every night and then when we would go to games you know we would drive to uh the stadium to go see the new york mets and he would drink like three beers on the way there because because the, and then we would sneak beers in like we would have uh, uh in the uh, binoculars case we would sneak three beers in and then because he didn't want to pay the the prices god he'd be turning in his grave if he knew what the prices are now it's like 19 dollars a beer at chase stadium or at city field now and then you go um and then he would drink, you know, th two more at the stadium. And I just thought everybody's dad did that. You know, I just didn't think that was a weird thing, you know. So, uh, you know, just got really bad, you know, start when you're drinking a bottle a day. And, you know, as every alcoholic, you have rules, you know, like I'm not going to drink alone. And then that goes out the window or I'm not going to drink before five. And then that goes out the window. But you're still I was still prolific. I was still solving stuff. I was still writing. I was still doing a lot. And then I would check my liver every three months, like get you know, uh, blood tests and my liver was fine. So I thought everything was all right, but it was like my relationships were doing bad and just a lot of just, just stuff and blacking out a lot. And it was not a good sitch, you know? Yeah. It's mad that we can go to those dark places when, like you say, it's trying to convince yourself we'll never drink alone, never drink past five, but then it starts seeping in. Mm -hmm. It's not just nighttime. It's afternoon. And yeah. It's morning and then you ain't sleeping. And then you do sleep you're waking up and straight back to whatever you're doing to take away the feeling of normality. Yeah. And we convince ourselves because if you function through it, if you're not as bad as everyone else, mm -hmm. looking at other addicts, you maybe look oh, yeah, at anyone yeah. addict and you think, I'm not there. Yeah. Because you convince yourself. So I could go for a sunbed and top up my tan and wear a nice suit. Like nobody's seen the inner pain mm -hmm. because that can't be hidden no matter what you do. So, yeah, it's a weird. Thing. Yeah, and it's such a when you look at drinking now. When I, I, I haven't been. You know, I went through a lot of because you're drinking for medication to self medicate. Yeah. So when you're off of it and you're alone with your thoughts and everything like that, you're you're, you're in a bad place. And I was in a bad place for a really long time. Uh, you know, had a lot of suicidal thoughts. Got really close to to doing something awful, and pulling out of that now and this really seeing our country's relationship with alcohol and just how much of a just a I, I understand people need it to mate people need it on dates and things but to loosen up yeah. and that kind of thing but just the amount of of money that we spend on it the amount of time that we waste on it and yeah i never want to be one of those bible big book thumpers but it's just you're starting to see a lot more people be sober and uh, and be sober out loud. You know, it used to be it was Alcoholics Anonymous. They didn't want you to talk about it, not so much as to um, out somebody, but they didn't want other people to, if you messed up, they didn't want people to say, oh, AA doesn't work, you know? Um, but the the people that you'll meet, they're the most like non-judgmental people in the world. And we talk about, 
you know, uh, before we, we, we started here, we're talking about sort of tribalism and that kind of thing. And it's very much a, um, you meet your people and everybody there has a, and the stories that you have and the, and the, the times you fucked up, that's your currency almost, you know, and that's what you, you bring to the, the group and then you bring the solutions to the group. And then it's an amazing thing where you can't keep your sobriety unless you give it away in the mm -hmm. sense of, you know, helping the next person. And that's, um, something that is, uh, really, uh, something that that's special. And, and I, I used to think that I used to thank God that my mom found it because she had her people then, you know, she had friends, you know, cause it's hard for a widow to have friends and things. But for me, I wish I would have learned stuff, the stuff that I've learned in the big book, like even before I had, I thought I had a problem just because it's such a, it really turns you into a, a better person mm -hmm. and an accountable person. You know? What was the moment you decided to get help? I, I, um, I had gotten like, I was at a, a, at a party for my podcast and I had, uh, I got complaints that I had hugged people inappropriately and I had, um, I had touched, apparently had touched somebody's butt, which I don't remember. I had no idea. And, um, I, I, uh, they they took away the podcast that i created you know so then then i like i really started spiraling i had been spiraling the year before that and i had even talked about it on my podcast just to talk about how uh suicidal i was and, and my next book was going to be about suicide actually because i thought just remember with numbers you know there's three times as many suicides as there are homicides you know so maybe is there any way to save those people and uh, and save myself in the process. So I was thinking about doing that, but, but it started getting worse and worse. And, um, as I, I just started drinking more and more because of that. And then the, the, uh, when the news broke like in May or something like that, um, just th then I just sort of went off the deep end with drinking so much. And it was either I had to come up with, you know, after like a month of that, it was having, all right, I'm either going to kill myself, I'm going to kill myself drinking, or I'm going to get help. So I went to rehab, and I didn't do it for any kind of PR thing or anything. I just went went to a place in the Bay Area for a month. And, um, you know, you lose, you know, you're, 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 you've lost everything. You know, you've, you know, you've lo I lost, you know, a lot of my jobs, but like I had lost my medicine, you know, that was the big thing. Your best friend, isn't it? Yeah. And you have to write a letter to alcohol, like a good Dear John letter, you know, in rehab, uh, breaking up with alcohol. And at first, I'm just like, oh, man, you know, I love alcohol. You know, and I'm writing, a, I remember like 15 years old or 14 years old when I was throwing up in the back of, uh, you know, at the, at the keg party. And I remember like this and that and this time that we had that great whiskey and this and that. But, I'm, but then at the end, I was just like, but fuck you. You know, you... Yeah, you know, I don't want to just blame it on you. A lot of it's on me, but I'm done with you. And uh, the amount of money that I spent with you, you know, spending a thousand bucks at least a, a month, you know, maybe more than that on liquor. And it was just, um, did that. And it's been a rough road. Uh, finally sort of pulling out of it over the past few months, just um, of, you know, never really saw that pink cloud that you get with, with, uh, with that some people get with getting sober, but just love the community and the different group of friends. And I kind of traded my, yeah, you know, I still have my friend, my hockey friends. I still have my journalism friends, you know, my, my Hollywood friends are gone and my, those have been replaced by my recovery friends. And I have a lot more recovery friends in there. It's a lot different. Yeah. It's good to share it with people who are on the same boat mm -hmm. because it doesn't sink and it's not as heavy because yeah. people are kind of releasing something and, it's a weird old thing, addiction, how we can get ourselves in such a mess. But again, alcohol was so glorified. It just seems beautiful. Yeah. Now, if you're writing a letter to alcohol when you first tried it and you go through the years, a lot of my best memories are with it. Yeah. And that's the fucking sad thing. I mm -hmm. um, don't know if it's because the fake confidence and lowers the depression, um, but it does something special to you where you just want to keep doing it. Yeah. I didn't want to stop. So that's why, I, and then I took drugs to then keep going mm -hmm. because the way it made me feel. But once you get to your late twenties, early thirties, it takes its toll. Yeah, those happy times, those weekends that you can't fucking wait for to come, the Friday and the Saturdays, you start dreading them, but you still keep doing it because it's all you start to know. Yeah, and uh, 
you can't live in reality because you've lived in a bubble for so long, a fake bubble. And uh, that's a hard thing and that's where change comes tough because we're banging our head against the fucking wall. We want to stop, we can't stop, so it's a constant battle. So a lot of people don't stop because they're so caught up in doing the same shit, the mm -hmm. same patterns. And once you break away from it, it's, it is a beautiful journey. You can understand it more and you look at life better and you can see different things. And we all make mistakes and fuck up on the drink and drugs. What it happens. It's not, you're not the only one. I'm not the only one. There's fucking everyone who's drinking does something they regret. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So how did you, you still struggling with it? No, you know, it, it's like, you know, especially being here. So I landed yesterday and I open up my Yelp app and oh, I swear God. every starred thing on Yelp was a pub. So I love, I love history. I love the pubs and everything like that. But I went to, you know, pub last night. I had a non-alcoholic Guinness, which were actually very good. Um, went to the, uh, this place, uh, you know, called the Dove uh, today. It had a, uh, actually had a lemonade, you know. I don't really see, you know, it's like when I go to an event and I see they have an open bar and it's like, oh, they have the good stuff too. Or when I go to like a store, like stores now, like Todd Schneider or something, when you go into a men's, men's uh, wear store and they've got like, do you want a drink? You know, it's just like, where the hell were you, you know, five years ago, yeah. you know, offering me bullet bourbon or whatever. So there, there's that. And I feel it for like 20 minutes when I'm there, like, oh, I wish I could drink, but then that goes away. And then when I'm walking away that going home, I'm like. That, that's a great feeling. Like, yeah. I don't have to deal with... It's the next day waking up. It's the yeah. best feeling yeah. when you feel fresh. I had a dream two nights ago that I was drinking again. Yeah. And I woke up and it felt real as fuck. I get them every six months. A, a dream? Like yeah. I'm partying. Mm -hmm. And I felt, whoa. But it gives me a good feeling to realise, okay, that was only yeah. a dream. Yeah. But it fucking seems real. What do you miss the most? I miss the high. I miss the camaraderie i miss the brotherhood yeah i miss sitting there everybody fucked up talking pure shit mm -hmm. we all got a care in the world even though we do it because we do care yeah we don't want to face the being the caring mm -hmm. person i miss many things from it I miss sitting at parties talking pure shit for days yeah because you grow a, a certain connection and bond with these people um because you're all fuck ups together you're all hiding from something i didn't know it then i just thought it was normal yeah um i miss the laughter I laughed so much in my twenties. I was a good jokester. Um, I still like a laugh now, but, but I became more professional. I forgot who I used to be. I'm starting to get that old James back. Uh -huh. I like to laugh, and I think fucking don't forget who you are. You're not a bad guy. Laugh. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like to carry on, but I, I kind of when you become professional, you become. So, I was so caught up in this lane of taking this podcast somewhere. I was scared of losing it. So everything became serious. Yeah. This is my business. I don't want to speak to anybody. I'll be a recluse and just work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. Now I've come out the other end of it. I've made something special. Um, I've got my audience, which I appreciate and I love daily. The people who followed from the start, the newcomers. It's unbelievable. The respect I get is beautiful, but it makes me now, yeah, let loose and enjoy it. Yeah. Well, that's great. You know, like this podcast is something that we don't really have anything kind of like this in America where you're you're reaching out to people that are imperfect you know and hearing their stories and it's all it's not really in a in a lane other than the fact that it seems like everybody that you that you have on has some amount of imperfection they, mm -hmm. they're interesting they do something inter interesting or anything like that but they're not you know nobody's choir boy and um and really really interesting and and i think that that that's one of the things like that like you're talking about with your mates and the drinking and the, and the laughing and just going on about everything it's like how do you get that in order to save people and save men you know to do that without drinking it's yeah. it's hard you know what i mean you know just having five guys just sitting there not drinking you know it can be it's like we we've got to the people did it in the past but we're so yeah, we're, we're, we're so dull, programmed because you've tasted that when you walk by a pub now and you hear everybody laughing, I don't even smoke, but if I was drinking, I would smoke cigarettes. Yeah. Just oh, to yeah. feel Oh, totally. I yep. just wanted to go outside and just mingle. I, I have a better conversation out smoking fucking cigarettes. I don't even fucking smoke. Mm -hmm. I must have been a pest because I used to just take people's fags. But yeah. I just loved uh, the extra you, hit that I got and yeah. the extra just feeling yeah. part of that. Again, tribalism, feeling part yeah. of you. Give me that cigarette. Let's talk you shit. Know the, the closest thing is cigars. 
Yeah. I don't smoke cigars. I'm not a fan of cigars, but like a lot of times after I go to this men's meeting um, and afterwards, you know, we have a smoke session and it's a lot, it's very similar to drinking where everyone's talking shit or whatever like that, but you're not going to get hung over. You're just having a cigar. Mm -hmm. They're expensive and you know, whatever, but it's just like, um, and they're not necessarily that great for you, but it's not drinking. And yeah. and it has that, that sort of, that level Feeling there. of something. Yeah. Yeah. That's the the feeling of it but there's a pub in every corner so it's difficult to get away it's advertised football teams sponsor it it's just well, everywhere. you know i started going to a meeting in la that's like every day at seven o'clock in the morning the only time i used to wake up at seven o'clock in the morning was to watch british football in la it was even yeah, earlier than that forward, yeah. yeah and i would i would I, and the, the 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 one that i was going to in la at seven in the morning is right across from a uh, one of those pubs, you know, in uh, in, yeah. in Studio City, and you're seeing those people drinking. Like as I'm going in, I'm just watching those yeah. people drinking there, and uh, as I pull in, you're just like, wow. So like when I go to go to a match or any, anything, because like, first football match I ever went to is like 10, 15 years ago at the at the Eddie Had, and I remember I had d drinks. I bought the drinks thinking I could go and drink them down at the seats, so I made that rookie American mistake. Mm -hmm. So I had to pound them before we went down. And then, you know, you, you have these, um, was it Mary D's pub there in, in Manchester where they do the lock-ins, which is like a whole different thing mm -hmm. uh, than here because the pubs close very late, very early here, but they can lock you in mm -hmm. um, and, and that sort of thing. So that whole, you know, places do close early here, which is actually probably good for people. But um, yeah, when I see somebody on TV, like I've started rewatching Mad Men and I'm seeing how much drinking they're doing and how like how good the bourbon looks, but then but that's just advertisement. Like, oh, it's totally an every advertisement. movie you'll get Coca Cola, Budweiser, cigarettes. If you see a criminal wearing a suit, drinking a Budweiser, smoking a cigarette, you, for some weird reason you think it's cool. Mm -hmm. It's fucking mad, but we don't speak about the damage it does mentally, physically, spiritually, um, the effects it takes on the mind as you become tired. Where you're thinking, what's wrong with me? And uh, it's just the shit that you're putting in your body, the stuff that you're consuming. I think now people are too busy counting calories instead of looking at the chemicals that are actually in the foods. Yeah. Um, but this is the world we're in. Like I say, I'm blessed to have kind of seen it differently now. Yeah. I do see it differently, but I still love sugar. I still love overeating. I love I love sugar, man. Yeah. That's the, that's the that's problem, man. That's my only weakness now. Um, and I, <laughs> I will master it. I believe my peak will be in my 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh -huh. and, and people go, he fucking looks great, him. Yeah. Um, well, it, yeah, it's just like we. W I went to a a, a premiere of the show. Uh, it was called Blue Lights. It's a um, the Brit Box show, and uh, it was all these like Northern Ireland kids that were there that are actors. That uh, it's a show over there, and uh, they had British candy, you know. So they had like the Maltesers and everything, and I was just yeah, like, yeah. I'm gonna, you know, it's like so much of that stuff. Yeah. And, um, it's, uh, it's just that's the, the sweet tooth thing is one of those yeah sugar you know it's a, that's another thing uh, is is the uh, that's the biggest uh, addiction the sugar. it's rough yeah. but again we've got to fucking live we're not going to go perfect we may as well go a bit scraped and bruised but everything's to do how you feel and yeah. i just i haven't got another recovery in me i always say it i just am too tired of it yeah um and that's when i go to events it's good for two hours you see people drink and you kind of go there as if they're doing well, mm -hmm. but when you go home the next day and they, you don't see them for three or four days, mm -hmm. you think, no, I'm the one that's doing well. Yeah, and I used to, you know, I went in through a, my thing was like I would pregame, so I'd have like a couple mixed drinks, would probably have been like four or five uh, at home, you know, in my house in the Hollywood Hills, and then I'd go out you know, take an Uber because you don't want to drive drunk. That was always my rule, never drove drunk. So, yeah, I did. <laughs> yep. And then... um then you know drink you know 18 dollar cocktails or whatever then come back drink a little bit more and then the next morning i was never really a big hangover guy but i always just didn't feel great so i'd i'd have a you know mcdonald's i'd always order McD and i was like so lazy that i'd have it delivered mm -hmm. you know the mcdonald's coca-cola was like the That's cure the for that thing. hangover. i had some of that last night yeah when i was driving down i took a pit stop a couple hours from london because it was like midnight and I thought you, you, there is a craving for it because it fuck it, it's the best juice on the planet for some reason. I well, think they put it in a I know what the reason machine. Is. No, you yeah. know what it is? Yeah, okay. They put, so they should put it in like a um what is the machine? The certain material. They, they ship the, they yeah. ship it in iron containers iron. Yeah, 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 or whatever. So that it's not shipped in bags like everybody else yeah. has. And they ship it cold. 
So that's the first thing. Second thing is, is that they have a different uh, uh, chemical formula for the ice. So the ice doesn't water it down as much mm -hmm. as it would other places. And then they give you that straw because they want it to hit all your taste buds more and everything. It's like they've got it down Perfect. pat. So I would get that and fries and a, and a, a quarter pounder. And then I would be, you know. It's so bad I'd, for you yeah. McDonald's as well. I don't <laughs> even like fucking promoting it, but I was away to Saudi Arabia with my brother-in-law for the Tyson Fury fight. Yeah. And when we come back, when we were driving down or when we come back, I got to try, he's a fat bastard. So he gave me, it was a McChicken sandwich, mm -hmm. um, like a Big Mac, the Big Mac chicken sandwich. Oh, yeah. fuck me, man. It was beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to go to McDonald's over because I like to see like the different, <laughs> the, the different taste, sandwiches. It that you taste got everywhere here. though. It yeah. tastes different everywhere. Yeah. And, and also the different, like you guys have like the rodeo burger or something like that. And it's yeah. just like your version of a, yeah. of a barbecue burger. But right. yeah, no, I will always, uh, I'll always hit it. And it's, it, it's still, it tastes like home wherever you are though too. Which How is was great. your podcast? Well, I had a bunch of different ones. So I had the, the Murder Squad podcast, which was like in the top fifty in America. You know, it was a big, it was a big deal, and we were trying to solve murders with that. And um, did you solve any? Uh, we got one. Uh, our big thing was trying to get people to put their DNA in the database, and somebody did that, and then we were able to get a, a murder solved through that. But um, otherwise, so see if somebody puts their DNA in the database, how can that then help solve a murder? Well, if you put your DNA in the database, and then police are going to look, they've got DNA from a crime scene from thirty years ago they're going to put that into the database and then they don't find that person but they find you and then they go and interview you and then they then you say well this is my family tree oh i've got this uncle you know who used to do this this and this then they look at the uncle and then they say this guy looks pretty good looks like the timeline he was in the town he has an arrest record blah 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 then they'll follow him around and get pick up like a a piece of uh you know a paper that he had put in his mouth or something or a, a coke can or a, or a pizza crust or something and then they'll get his dna match it one-on-one -on -one, and then boom yeah that's mad i never thought of that using oh, yeah. other people's dna that's to what they're, yeah get links to yep yeah yeah interesting so that done well how's life now uh life's good now yeah you know just um got some you know people in the books in terms of sponsees uh, my kids are great. You know, I got two kids. One of them is, uh, studying for the LSAT. So he'll be a, a lawyer, hopefully one day. My daughter's, uh, getting her PhD in entomology. She's into bugs. She's always, she was, you know, it was so cool. She's like, she was into bugs as a little kid and now she's like studying it, you know, getting a, yeah. Getting her doctorate in, in, in bugs. So she it's kind of cool to see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, just, uh, just looking at, at what I want to do in terms of what I want to write next, you know, um, you know, did the, obviously did the solving the solving the murders thing was the first book. Second book was the opioid epidemic and the, how these murders aren't solved. And, and then the third book I think is going to be more, I want to find that kind of hero aspect of it. So like the Roy Larners of the world and, mm -hmm. and been collecting those stories and going to talk to those people and see what, what we can get out of that. Um, because, you know, the big people, people actually come up to me and they lament like, oh, there's no more serial killers anymore, which is a ridiculous thing to say. <laughs> But yes, the, the golden age of serial killers was the 70s and 80s in America. We had a lot of them. You don't, where did they go? Some of them do become mass shooters, you know, and mass shootings are so big in America and they're so hard to stop. You have to stop them while you're there. And who's going to charge the gunman, you know, and we're starting to see a switch now in what you're supposed to do. Uh, where, you know, they're telling people, you know what, you should sometimes, if you have an opportunity, you should charge the, the gunman, mm -hmm. um, under certain circumstances. And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of other things that go into that, but, um, there's, there's a responsibility as a human, as humans now in, as we enter this age of, you know, terrorism is going to start ramping up more and more now as we see the next generation of, of terrorists you know we 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 battled isis we got rid of a lot of the isis people but you know um isis is back uh you've got right-wing terrorists now and you've got a lot of serial shooters um and uh and mass shooters so those are like the huge big issues that are happening right now and i want to see um, really looking into those and seeing, uh, you know, what can be done and what the stories that can be told there are. The thing about life, there's always going to be new issues every other year, every 10 years. Yeah. Full circle, things just change, but there's still going to be misery. What do you think needs to be put in place to help with the school shootings in America? You know, 
it, some say you need a, an armed guard in every in every school, which is rough. You know, it's just like and and I've gone through the. There's nothing more terrifying as a parent than getting that call or that text message saying your school's on lockdown. There's an active shooter. I had that in in my kid's school. And you rush there and all the parents are there and we're just waiting. It turns out a kid had brought a gun to school and he shot himself. But the, you know, he had the gun out. There was an armed guard uh, that's a, actually a police officer, not just a guard that was there that was telling him to stop, had the, had his gun out to, and the kid killed himself, unfortunately, or died by suicide. Um, and it's such a horrible uh, situation. The feeling, though, of a parent, you know, thank God, obviously it wasn't my kid, but you're you're just feeling of, of what that kid's parents must have felt like. And just it's a rite of passage almost in America to get that that call. What needs to happen? Um, outreach. Uh, you know, this kid apparently for for this one kid who easily could have potentially could have gone the other way and shot up a bunch of people. He had gotten a scholarship taken away because he was found with weed or some some bullshit like that. You know, it's like that kind of stuff. The um, uh, we're never going to get rid of the access to guns. You know, after the the shooting of of the kids in Newtown, Connecticut, and the fact that that didn't change anything, it's how is it ever going to change now? You know, um, you had literal kindergartners being killed, and that still has not changed anything. So, uh, the guns are going to be there, whether we have uh, police officers with guns. I think that is is a possibility that that you know could happen. Um, and then just you know mental health resources for kids. You know, and but then there's a fine line. You don't want to stigmatize somebody that you think might might do something you know mm. based on that so it's rough see when you're solving those murders and the police come to you to try and help solve them what kind of passes do you have to then try and push the boundaries to get information do you get any special treatment or do you just treat it like as a civilian no i treat it as a civilian yeah i mean it, i have do my big thing special is special privileges i will now i never never name names in public you know what i mean never say i, I got it or anything like that until the police make the arrest uh -huh. um using a lot of stuff that you would use in journalism like would i get sued for this is this libel you know that kind of thing so being a trained journalist helps with that but you've got um no i i'm just basically a civilian which is one of the reasons why people talk you know They'll talk to me because they they know they know the way it's written, the way the ads are written, the way the the page is set up. You know, because I set up a page for each murder, so it's not like Cook County Sheriff's Office. Uh, you know, and this is just one thing. It's like River North Puncher. This is just about this mm -hmm. murder. You know, so um, they know that that it's it's different than the the police. And um, I wish more police departments would do that. You know, I kind of I wrote that first book very much thinking this is teaching a man to fish. You know, mm -hmm. as opposed to giving him the fish. So um, they're out there, and it's it's uh, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of money, but uh, you can do it. And the police, and then then when the police get into it, they they start your name like in la this happened after el monte then your name goes around and then they're trying to get you to help solve burglaries and this and that and just a bunch of stuff yeah yeah, yeah. That's, uh, where do you go forward for the future brother <sighs> yeah you know what i'm 51 years old and uh you've been doing this for i think i'm coming up on 25 years of writing about crime you know and i want to do something i want to definitely do something I want to continue. I'll, I'll never stop trying uh, to solve these things and families that reach out to me. I always help. And uh, that, that number keeps growing as well. The families that I still talk with, but then I want to, um, want to just do something a little bit more on the positive angle of it. And, um, and also on the national security angle, like with the terrorism, because I think I worry about what's going to happen with, you know, we're entering a really in America, but also it affects you guys as UK, well. UK and America are a threat. Yeah, it, it we're entering a, a time when we we will have a war on three fronts. We've got the the Russia war, China, and we've got China, and then we've got Israel in the Middle East. Palestine, yeah. And um, that is supplanting. You know, we had a blank check for terrorism for twenty years because of nine eleven. So we just threw everything at the wall of terrorism and. It's not like the, no terrorist attacks happened. There were a ton of uh, terrorist attacks. There were a lot of terrorist attacks here, you know, but we didn't have that big 9-11 one. So everybody was just like, oh, wow, that must have worked. 
um, mm. you know, the second generation from those people um, are there and they're going to be ramping up for something new. And um, what do you think of 9 yeah. 11? What do you think of it? 9 11. It was bad. What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean? But what what do you bit? think of it? The whole issue behind it and airplanes and everything that happened. Like with bin Laden and do um, I think it was a conspiracy? Or I wouldn't anything? say a conspiracy. You wouldn't want to say that, especially with so many victims. But how it, it, the planes managed to get there is puzzling to me. <sighs> you know what? We there was a guy. You know, they flew. A couple of guys flew from Maine to Boston first, right? And there was a security guard um, who was like a TSA guy um, who was who stopped Muhammad Atta. And he actually said afterwards, he said, he left him, let him on the plane. He said first, he said, if this guy doesn't look like a Middle East terrorist, I don't know what does. He said that in his head. And he, he said that subsequently in interviews, but he knew that like, if I stop him, then it's racial profiling and I might, might shouldn't put him on or whatever. He gets on, those guys get on, you know, security was, was way more lax back then. Obviously you could take a, you remember for all the sophisticated stuff that we've got, they did this with flight training and with box cutters, you know, it was very simple and, and, and really ingenious in its simplicity. Um, we as a country, um, yes, we had to go against uh, Afghanistan and got involved in a very long war there. Uh, we gave Saudi Arabia a pass. Uh, a lot of them are from Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is a, is a, uh, so an ally of ours. So, and they also have a lot of oil. Um, but a lot of the terrorists are from Saudi Arabia, you know. So uh, how they were able to 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 pull this off um, was just we got caught with our pants down, you know. And we literally yeah. had, you know, there's a document. The president had a document in August. The headline couldn't be more clear: Bin Laden determined to strike inside the USA. That was the headline. You can't get any more clear than that. But. Um, it was also a matter of the United States intelligence services and organizations not talking to each other. They're very siloed. And this is a this is a thing that happens with murders on the ground, too. We've got 17,000 different police departments and organizations. They don't talk to each other, not nearly as much as they should. It's gotten better. But you can have somebody that kills somebody in one state. And then kill somebody in another state and they won't link them together. You can have, you know, that's why you see a lot of these trucker murders kind of thing. You'd see that somebody picks up a girl in one state, kills them, drops her off in another state. They don't put two and two together. There's no database that they are forced to put into um, unsolved uh, murders. There's no database that you're forced to put in um, unidentified remains or missing persons. It's it's all volunteering. Yeah, I once... I did a, um, a show on a uh, history channel about DB Cooper and uh, I, they paired me with a former deputy director of the FBI. And I was complaining about this, the fact that nothing talks to Gary. And I said, listen, when we started our country separating from England, we, we didn't want what, what England had, which was like a central government. We were worried about tyranny more than anything else. So that's the reason why it's set up the way it is. So you've got 17,000 different computers to, saying 17,000 different things. On 9-11, you had even the FBI and the CIA not talking to each other, you That's know? That's crazy. So that has gotten a lot better and, you know... Uh, Did Bin Laden own... I don't know if it's a myth, but they say he owns like 7 8% of America. The family were so powerful and they were the only ones allowed to fly out. I, I know the family did fly out the Is family flew out. I think the I think that's been confirmed. I don't know about how much they owed or anything. But like they owed that, a, but a, a family members did fly out, yeah. It's mad though how the destruction of the world can be. They tried fucking driving through Glasgow airport with bombs. Yeah. Mad. Yeah. And, and the Glasgow guy was saying, fucking come to Glasgow, we'll I, fucking that, do you. And yeah, I think he's in New York there, Smito. That the guy. Smito. No, that, that's a guy I would want to talk to. If, uh, I, if I do that project, I'm going to talk to that guy. Yeah, he's I was, he's I was in New about, York. I think he's in America. I was reading about him last night, yeah, actually. Mad he, he was, he's kind of like Larner. With, I with think the, there was a few of them done it. And uh, obviously, when somebody gets popular and becomes a hero, he's getting all that yeah. attention. Other people then say well, he's not the real hero. May, it, maybe it's something that is a Scottish and, and English thing because that's why I'm I'm interested in seeing that. Like um, uh, Steve Gallant and, and um, um, who who had the uh, fire extinguisher in that one and the guy Roy, with the, Roy Lanner, uh, Smito. Uh, there's a few. The guy with the narwhal tusk. Yeah, but I think that's the British mentality is yeah. to fight. 
as well. Listen, Britain's invaded majority of the world. <laughs> I know. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Scotland were terrorised for yeah. thousands of years. So the Irish, they've got that fight in blood. Um, if they don't see something right, they will stand up for I think it. That's, I think that's really interesting. And that's something that is like, well, how do you use that as a, because in America, you know, you look at certain things in America, obviously Columbine was the first mass shooting mm -hmm. and nobody really went and tried to tackle those kids. You see more of the tackling now and that kind of thing, but it very much is like, you know, obviously Roy Larner was a football guy that used to probably get in fight. Millwall, you can't get yeah. any more tough I than Millwall. I think in Brazil yeah. and uh, Colombia, I think if you see people getting robbed, I think you can kill them now. Or mm -hmm. they drive over the top of them, like people in scooters jump off, yeah. try and rob. I think bystanders can drive oh, over yeah. them and stuff, yeah. They've changed the laws. They can actually harm people who try to rob, which uh -huh. is a good thing as well, I think. Because here now, if someone breaks into your house and you beat that man to death or kill him or injure him, you can get sued. Yeah. Fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. <laughs> Someone tried to break into a house, fell through the roof, and the guy sued the, the, the man for you're having roofish. a bad roof. You're roofish. Yeah. <laughs> and then one, it's like, some things are just common sense, um, but I don't make the laws, um, but it's just weird. But life is good. Plans for the future then, tell me. Life is, life is good. Plans for the future. Yeah, I might do that That Imperfect Heroes book. Um, I think that's probably something that I've been thinking of, especially as I've been here and uh might talk to some of those guys while i'm here and um uh yeah just uh looking out at what our next uh threats are going to be and still solving some murders and um you know just trying to enjoy uh enjoy you know you talked about before it's like how do you enjoy yourself you know trying to enjoy life and i do you know it's just like i like watching uh british football i like watching you know one of the things i've learned in recovery is becoming more invested in something that you don't have any control over mm -hmm. you know and i had to very much especially with the trying to solve stuff it's so hard to have control over it you can push to a certain extent but then after a while you gotta you gotta just you'll you'll go crazy yeah. uh, without getting the answers but you know just like watching a baseball game or watching a football match like i've got no control over this thing i'm just going to watch it whatever happens happens and mm -hmm. then just experience life what is all your social media platforms so people maybe wants to get in contact yeah, with you? Uh, yeah billy jensen on instagram is probably the easiest way you know i'm still yeah. on still on twitter but not many people are on twitter anymore where can you buy your books um, you know, I'd probably go to Amazon. It was probably the best bet, mm -hmm. you know, go to a, um, a local bookstore and ask for it as well. You know, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, killers amidst killers has a red cover with a skull on it made out of, out of, uh, the, the, uh, the pills and um it's a crazy cover and uh you know chase darkness with me is the first one so just uh you know that's what happens when you when you finish that's the, the second book it's like all right i got the second book out of the way not a one hit wonder what's you know what do you do next and uh you know just want to do something just uh, a little bit different and it's crazy you know like being in london it's such a crime town in a sense where reading wise you know you go into a bookstore you see crime they're talking about fiction crime but it's a huge section you know like mm -hmm. crime fiction really originated here and um y'all are a bunch of people that love mysteries and love to solve yeah. stuff and things yeah. yeah so it's um you get sherlock holmes and shit. sherlock holmes and, and jack the ripper and everything it's just that you've got it all here and you've got the windy little alleyways and everything it's just such a it's kind of a magical place the same way that you feel about new york and i do new york is still my favorite city but coming here it's just uh there's very much of a of a sense of um, yeah, the architect in london yeah. is unbelievable yeah. it's one of the best in the world for the buildings and the old kind of historian but in history behind that it is it's mad it's a beautiful place but i just hope things change here because i've been saying it the last couple of years just a little weird vibe here mm -hmm. i don't know what it is a little uneasy um well if the men keep on listening to this podcast and, and watching this youtube channel you know hopefully they'll find their tribe you know because yeah. that's what you're doing you know what you're doing with anything goes is you're creating this tribe and people the men that are that are watching this are you in the same way that you would identify yourself as a as a type of music you know like i'm a punk i'm a i'm a I'm a mod or whatever like that. They're identifying themselves as like watchers of this, you know? So, um, and then they might also watch, you know, a Uberman pocket or something along those lines, but, you know, getting those male voices out there with something positive is, is huge. So appreciate that. that. Right, well, well, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, man, that's it. That's it. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Thanks for coming over. Man. Right. Listen, enjoy the rest of your stay. Stay out of trouble. And I hope you're not trying to solve any murders here, mate. I hope we don't see any murders to solve, but, 
Listen, if there is, mate, I'm sure you'll be the man to call. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks.